chips, bees, popcorn. Ah, ballerina, check one, two. Hello? Test one.
script. This is quite long. Well, I, I might read, I, I'd like to read, try to read at least the first the paragraph or something. The reference, the yeah. 835. Okay. Yes. How are you? Good morning, Director. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning see. How are you? Just fine, and you? Fun stuff. What's that? We're Friday. Oh, yes, 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 I agree. Good morning. Tommy Wright. Tommy Wright. Uh, Tommy Wright, Tommy Wright. Um, welcome to the second day of the uh, fall meeting of the Census Bureau Scientific Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, we had, had lively discussion yesterday, and I know many of you have already told me you're looking forward to today's morning. Who said that? <laughs> Who said that? So rather than so this is our way of summarizing what happened yesterday. Who said that? So let's just get right to it, talk on it. I would give, so just to remind you, there are no rules, there are no losers, and there are no winners. You just yell out the answer, and you have inner satisfaction that how, how you score it. So. <laughs> One hint, the, 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 this year, the, uh, of course, we, I think it's been every year, the, uh, and these are not exact quotes, by the way. Uh, so these are uh, ordered in the, in the, in the order according to the agenda. So if that's a hint. But I may throw in some data for disaster recovery. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. OK, you win. Yeah, that was, right. Well, but there are no winners. There are no winners. No. We must stay relevant. We foster innovation. For example, through the Census Opportunity Project, address canvassing operation began on August 18th. We must remain a leader in data and statistical products. Who said that? You said that. <laughs> I'm guilty. All right, okay. Uh, I think eight. 3.8 billion fully funds our decennial requests. Uh, and then the person went on to say billions and billions and billions. It reminded me of a, I think we've all heard that phrase before. Yes, but yeah, but Carl Sagan said the billions and billions, but who said the, who said billions over and over again? Yes. What about construction statistics? We can't move leftover money from 2020 census to construction programs. <laughs> we follow, okay. Fusion Center, what's going on? I felt like singing the song, I heard this several times. The Fusion Center, what's going on? You know, Marvin Gaye for what's going on. But <laughs> the Fusion Center, who defined that? Actually, two people could be possible answers. Enrique and Al. Enrique mentioned it first, but Al also followed up. <clears throat> Any assessment savings from in-office address canvassing? I don't say Jack. Jeff, Jeff, a J name, but what do you do with the incomplete responses when you get incomplete responses? Yes. Mass stats just throw rocks at me when I start talking like this. Ow. Yes. <laughs> We now say 
adults, children, and babies living, staying at this address, or we plan to say. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. 1,300 partnership specialists on board as of yesterday. Could be Al, but we'll let, we'll let, we'll let set that. Uh, and and here's, here's, a sequ here's a sequence of events, uh, and we're wrapping up almost. Real-time 2020 administrative record experiment census simula simulation and compare results between an administrative record census and the survey style uh, census taking in real time at the same time. Ooh. Jennifer? Jennifer said that. And then someone follow up with the question, will this really be 100% a complete thing for the entire country? Will this be an administrative record? Maybe not an exact quote. Jay said that. And then there was a very short uh, answer, yes. Yeah. <laughs> if you remember. Bert, uh, population equals births minus deaths plus immigration minus immigration. Eric, we found that approximately 200,000 children aged zero to four that were born in the United States were living in Mexico at the time of the 2010 census. We, we learned this from the Mexi Mexico 2010 census, I believe. Yes, well, thank you very much. I'm sorry there isn't more. I can tell you want more. But that, did I leave out any, anyone's feelings hurt? Okay, good, okay, I get it good. If anyone intends to give public comment this morning and has not done so, please provide your name at the registration desk. <clears throat> For webcast viewers, a call-in number will show up on your screens during the public comment session, scheduled today at 11 uh, a.m. As we begin, I want to remind members and those joining us in the room that it is not allowed to use your smartphone to take pictures inside Census Headquarters, nor are cameras or any other recording devices. Also, visitors are not allowed beyond the first floor without an escort. I would like to remind members to please turn uh, your tent card up when you're ready to speak. Once called upon, turn on the microphone at your table and clearly state your name. Always state your name for the record. This is needed each time you speak for the most accurate transcripts. Please be advised that side conversations may be heard on the tabletop microphones. <clears throat> Each member should, be, should have received already a, a travel reimbursement package. Please turn them in to init before you uh, leave. For committee members needing a ride uh, to ride the bus to the hotel, the bus will leave the Census Bureau promptly at 2.15. The bus will make a stop at 2.45 at Ronald Reagan National Airport and at 3.15 at the hotel. Just as a reminder, due to federal guidelines governing meetings and conferences, the refreshments provided are for committee members only. Uh, let me, before I turn it over to Allison, I want to, let's see, am I going to read this? I, I want to make note of something. Kathleen, uh, Kathleen, do you want to say something? Kathleen, she's sitting at the table, but she gave me a, a, a follow-up note yesterday. I think there were questions about census and schools. What schools will be participating, public versus private? And I, I, you want, I you don't have it something? in front of me, so if you can read it, that, oh. Mm. This is the answer that one of you had asked about uh, how we found um, the information about the private schools. Um, so the Statistics in Schools program used a couple of avenues to develop its school lists. For stateside schools, which includes all 50 states and the District of Columbia, we're using a list from the National Center for Education Statistics. They maintain a list that includes all public, private, and charter schools. Statistics in Schools also works with other groups such as the Bureau of Indian Education to ensure the list is representative of tribal areas. Um, the SIS program also worked directly with Puerto Rico's Department of Education. The Secretary of Education provided the list of all public and private schools in Puerto Rico that will be used for the mail out. And for the island areas, we coordinate with the decennial advisor for each island and they in turn work with education officials on each island directly. So. Awesome. Thank you very much. Allison? Um, <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, 
I wanted to let y'all know that um, Maria Olmedo Malagón, who is in charge of the uh, communications, integrated communications program, who couldn't be here yesterday. She is here this morning. Where is she now? Oh, she's way in the back. She came and told me she's here until 945. So um, if folks had questions that they wanted to ask her, um, you know, we have a moment for that. And we might actually have one for you, Maria, um, if, if I have time this morning before we start. Yeah. Um, and um, also, it's exciting this morning that, we've, that we're going to be looking at the status update on the census data products, among other things. But that's exciting because we got a lot of detail ahead of time. And so we think it'll be a really robust discussion, just like the demographic analysis was really robust because we got a lot of detail ahead of time. Um, the, I heard a lot of feedback from um, uh, committee members that it was frustrating to have short amounts of time on the agenda that were mostly taken up by presentation and then we ran late. Of course, we all, everything worked out because we, we got everything done that we needed to by five o'clock, um, but we definitely prefer getting, um, having a discussant and getting a lot of detail ahead of time where, that we can dig into because we like the details. So um, uh, I'm sure we'll have more to say about that in our recommendations today. Um, but looking forward to all of the, the um, important um, conversations we're going to have today and also just want to super commend the committee members who did an awesome job writing recommendations yesterday. Oh my goodness, I hardly had to do anything last night which um, gave me great confidence about going ahead and taking the Ferris wheel ride. So, <laughs> which of course we paid for with our own dollars and not taxpayer dollars for the record. So, um, so looking forward to the conversations and um, you know, there was a question, uh, Maria, if you, um, if, if it's okay that I communicate it. Um, it's from the recommendations and let's see if I can get this right. I know there's a known answer to this and so rather than writing it in the recommendations, thought it might be better to just say it. It was a question regarding um, how uh, this very large communications um, uh, plan reaches out to um, and targets messages to so many diverse groups. And I've heard the answer to this, but I thought for the committee yeah. members who didn't know, you could talk about you know, the structure by which you're generating messaging beyond just the you know, translation of the logo and um, you know, yeah. whatnot, right? So from day one, I think that one of the mo most important things that we establish both with the staff that we have at the, at the Census Bureau working on communications, which is not only on the communications director, but we have people working on field, the research and methodology directorate, the CENIAL, et cetera. It's the fact that we have a very diverse staff working on this combined with a very diverse contractor. We have YNR as our main contractor, but our contractor has agencies representing the the black population, Hispanic, Puerto Rico, Asian, Nahopi, and, uh, and uh, AIM. So when doing our research, which is the base of our campaign and what I think makes it very unique also, we took, it, we brought everyone on the ta to the table. This was not a Census Bureau YNR decision, but it was an entire team YNR, which means all the subcontractors, decisions working on making this research. We made focus groups and surveys for CBAMs in which we cover all the groups. Um, we did a focus group for QUIP, which is when we test the platform, and then we made uh, online research, focus groups and community representatives uh, interviews during our creative testing about four or five months ago. What can I say with that? We did about 142 focus groups. We tested from everywhere, from San Juan, Puerto Rico to Honolulu, Hawaii, and everything in between. We tried for our audiences to test all kinds of things. We went for rural audiences, but not only your traditional rural audience. We went to look for those Hispanics, American Indians, and blacks living in rural, in rural areas. We also did very urban areas. We did suburban areas. We tried to reflect the diversity of the country. So the messages and what you will see in the campaign will be a very diverse campaign with messages that in general, let's say that we have top five messages, but we know from those top five messages overall, what specifically have worked better for each of the particular audiences. So we are definitely paying more attention to, let's see, let's say, if I have top five messages, both from CBAMS or from where we learn from creative, 
these top three things work much better with Nahopi. That's what we are using in Hawaii, and we are making it also available for the island areas to, to use in if, they, if they want to. You know, they have a total different communications campaign, but they will have. Like, if something works better in Puerto Rico, we are using that. So I was talking to someone earlier this morning, and we have different families on the creative. So that, that's something that also you will see in the next couple of months. And those families of creative, some are, I don't want to spill a lot, but some are more with children, some are more about your future, some are very oriented with the particular flavor of your community. And depending on how it worked with the audiences, we have given more attention and more space to those families within the audience and perhaps that family or oh, a family that is not being very used on Hispanic, you will see it a lot in Asia. So that's how we are reflecting different commun communities over there. I must say that for paid advertising being the larger area of the campaign, you can see that variety. We try to do that with partnerships. We try to give a little bit more of different uh, differences to social media, but Definitely, it has to be more standard. SIS definitely a very standard program, but for paid advertising, you will see a lot of personalization within the, within the groups. Yeah. So, what to 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 just reiterate how I understand it, and you can confirm um, what we learned at the special meeting that we had was uh, that that YNR has what is it, about five or six different subcontractors. Mm -hmm. Each specializes one. There's African American, Hispanic. There's exactly um, Native um, American. There's um, Hawaiian, right, mm -hmm. and that and that they each generated campaigns, right, and that and came up with um, ideas and messages, and and among those messages were chosen the messages, exactly. right. So it wasn't that there was a mess, a campaign developed. It was that got not a mess. It, it, everything came it down up. up. In yeah. fact, I love to say some. I would love to say something. Uh, the a lot of the messages that you will be seeing on the diverse audience campaign actually came from the smaller subcontractors that have great ideas, and people start copying. Other subcontractors mm -hmm. start copying, and the main contractor, like this big agency of New York, was really copying like ideas and adapting them to the diverse mass uh, campaign because they were really good. So you, nothing has been top down, everything has been from ground up, and in definitely based on, on the research. Even, I would say that for, for, at the very end for creative, we add a lot of community representatives interviews because we really wanted to double check a lot of messages with several particular audiences, audiences that are not as big, so we really needed to dig a little bit more, like Caribbean, like Haitian, like you need to, to dig a little bit more on those. Thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now let's turn to uh, Jason Devine and Cynthia Davis Hollinsworth who will present a status update on the 2020 data products plan. Follow up, and there is a discussion, Kathy, Catherine Pettit. So good morning, I'm Jason Devine. I work in the Population Division. I'm here with my colleague, Cynthia Davis Hollingsworth from the Decennial Census Management Division. We'll update you today on our proposed 2020 Census Data Products Plan. During the spring CSAC meeting, we discussed the proposed data products for the 2020 Census and the challenges we face with implementing a new method for disclosure avoidance called differential privacy. This presentation will be a continuation of that discussion with a focus on the design of the Demographic and Housing Characteristics File, or the DHC, as we're referring to it. But first, a little background. The Census has a long history of protecting information provided by respondents. Over the decades, more and more granular census data have been published, advances in data science, more powerful computers, and externally accessible big data, which contain a lot of personal information, has increased the risk of identifying individuals from published statistics. To mitigate this risk, 
The Census Bureau is implementing a new disclosure avoidance method for the 2020 Census. Our goal for the 2020 Census data products is to meet data user needs while Im implementing the new disclosure avoidance method. However, there are some challenges. Today we will discuss the 2020 Census data products that will be supported by the current differentially private disclosure avoidance system. We are developing other formal privacy systems for protecting 2020 census data products that include tabulations that provide counts of the population by detailed race and Hispanic origin groups and the population uh, detailed Hispanic race and origin groups, tribes, and the population by household family types. For those products not supported by the current disclosure avoidance system, we are conducting outreach to understand what the must-have tables are, both in terms of detail and geography. So initial feedback was collected through a July 2018 Federal Register notice, its extension, and associated outreach. Additional outreach has been conducted to obtain input from data users and a 2010 demonstration data product file based on the DHC as planned is being developed that will allow external data users to examine the impact on accuracy of using differential privacy. And additional outreach is planned, including a National Academy of Sciences workshop, and Cynthia will provide more information on the additional outreach and the outreach that has already taken place and what is planned in her portion of the presentation. Stakeholder feedback combined with a review of table access rates and subject matter expert knowledge is informing the development of the 2020 data products. The 2020 data products will include an initial set of products made up of legally mandated products and products with tables that are expected to be supported by the current differentially private disclosure avoidance system. A later set of products are planned to be produced that will include tables that will be protected using other formal privacy systems. The design of the later set of products will be informed by feedback and information we've already collected and additional feedback we hope to receive. The proposed 2020 data products have a structure similar to the 2010 census data products. On this slide, the proposed 2020 data products are grouped into three categories. Those products that the current disclosure avoidance system, uh, which will have a top-down algorithm, uh, either supports or is being expanded to support. This includes the two legally mandated products, the apportionment product and the redistricting file. It also includes the demographic profiles, the demographic and housing characteristics file, and the Congressional District Demographic and Housing Characteristics File. The Demographic and Housing Characteristics File, or the DHC, will include many of the tables available from Summary File 1 in 2010. The contents of this product will be a focus of the presentation today, along with an overview of how to use the product specification document that we provided to you prior to this meeting. The next category includes tables and products where differentially private systems will be developed that will allow for their release. These include detailed race and Hispanic, Hispanic origin tables and some family household tables included in summary file one in 2010, including tables with averages such as average age and average household size for different types of households. All tables that were included in summary file two in 2010, the American Indian Alaska Native summary file and the public use microdata sample file or PUMS. So the PUMS is unique in that the new methodology makes it possible to release the entire underlying microdata file but at this point, that file wouldn't include joins between household members uh, or the variables that are not included in the redistricting file or the DHC. The final file, the final category, includes two products we do not plan to produce for 2020 since uh, most of the data including, in, included in them is uh, available from other files. This would be the summary of population housing characteristics, CPH1, and the population housing, count, housing unit counts report series. So the presentation today will focus um, on those products that the current disclosure avoidance system with the top-down algorithm either supports or is being expanded to support. So this again includes the apportionment product, although I'll note the apportionment data will be published from data tabulated before disclosure is applied. The redistricting file, the demographic profiles, the demographic and housing characteristics file, and the congressional district demographic and housing characteristics file. And I'll mainly talk about the redistricting file and the demographic and housing characteristics file or the DHC and how you can get information about what is included in those files. Um, the demographic profiles are sourced from the DHC and the Congressional District Demographic 
and housing characteristics file is, is a retabulation of the DHC for new congressional boundaries. So a little bit about the redistricting file. The redistricting file will be the second product released from the 2020 census, coming after the release of the apportionment product, and the first file released that will include uh, demographic and housing characteristics for detailed geographic areas. The data provided the states under Public Law 94171 include data at the census block level on the voting age population, race by the OMB race groups, and the 57 possible multiple race combinations by Hispanic origin, his occupancy status, and the group quarters population for the seven major group quarters types. These data will be available at the census block level and must be released within one year of of Census Day. One update for the 2020 redistricting file was the addition of data for the seven major group quarter types, which were provided in a separate product in 2010, and including these data uh, in the redistricting file will allow us to better meet state redistricting needs. The prototype for this product from the 2018 census test was made available in March and was the first 2020 census product to use the new disclosure avoidance methodology. The 2018 redistricting file prototype specification is available on the redistricting pro data program webpage on census.gov and provides details about what is included in that product. Here's a screenshot of what the cover of that document looks like. I'm not going to go into detail about this so that we have time to focus more on the, the DHC. So as I, as I said, the DHC will include many of the demographic and housing tables previously included in summary file one. And you may hear, hear us later refer to the DHP and the DHH, where P stands for population and H housing, but in this presentation, I'll just refer to it as the DHC. Topics included in the DHC are listed on the slide, but I'll, I'll skip them here because I go into more detail about them in a later slide. Data in the DHC will be available for all geographies at and above the lowest level they are released for, which in many cases will be at the census block level. Notable exclusions from the DHC include tables that provide counts by detailed race, detailed Hispanic origin, tribes, and population by household family types, again, due to the implementation of the new differential privacy methodology. And we are developing other solutions for products that include these tables. The demographic profiles will provide demographic and housing characteristics about local communities from selected DHC tables in a streamlined, easy to use format as soon as, they, as soon as the release of the redistricting product as possible, or as soon after the release of the redistricting product as possible. And subjects will include five-year age groups, sex, race, Hispanic or Latino origin, household type, relationship to householder, group quarters population, housing occupancy, and housing tenure. The demographic profiles allow us to provide selected DHC tables sooner than the full DHC, and the current plan is for these tables to be available at the place in minor civil division level or above and above. So when considered together, the redistricting file and the demographic and housing characteristics file include a lot of demographic and housing data, with much of it being available at the census block level. So this slide shows what we plan to make available through the DHC at the lowest level of geography is proposed to be available for. In many cases, these tables will be repeated by major race and Hispanic origin groups. An asterisk allows you to see which tables these are. So at the census block, this will include total population, urban, urban rural designation, sex, race, Hispanic or Latino origin, sex by five year and other age groups, sex by single year of age under 20, relationship to householder, households by, um, households by householder characteristics, household type by relationship, Households by presence of people of specific ages, housing tenure, household size, group quarters population by sex and age for major GQ types, and median age for various groups. At the census tract, this includes population by single year of age up to 100 by sex, tenure by race, by Hispanic or Latino origin, and tenure by presence of own children. At the county level, this will include household size by household type by presence of own children, and household type by age of householder and household type by presence of people of specific ages. And there'll be one additional file available at the state level, which will provide the group quarters population by sex by age 
18 and over by group quarters type. So to allow you to explore what is proposed for inclusion in the DHC, we provide in advance of this meeting a product specification. So you can use this product specification. In the next few slides, I'm going to show you how you can use the specification. But uh, the way the file is set up, there's a lot of information in it. You can use the specification to see the tables that are included in the, DA, the demographic and housing characteristics file. It provides a crosswalk from the 2010 summary file table numbers to the 20. 20 DHC table numbers. It allows you to identify tables that are new in the DHC, and it shows you the tables that were in SF1 but are not going to be in the DHC. It shows the tables that will be included in the demographic profiles, and it provides the proposed lowest level of geography for each table. So before I get into some screenshots of the specification, there's a product uh, there's a table numbering convention that sort of will help you understand. If you understand this, you can look at the table and see and know what level of geography the table is available for and what type of table it is. So P tables are population tables, and if it's just a P, it's available at the block level. If it's a PCT table, it's a population table available at the track level. PCO table is available at the county level. PST table is available at the state level. A plain H table is a household table. It's available at the block level and an HCT table is a housing table available at the census track level. And remember, if it's available at, this, at, at any of these levels, it's also available at the levels above that level. OK, so this slide provides a screenshot of the key tab in the DHC file specification that we provided. This is the crosswalk tab, so the file includes Five tabs, the DP, if you look across the bottom, you'll see those tabs, the DP list of tables, the demographic profile, the DHC readme tab, and the DHC crosswalk and the DHC tables tab. Again, those are at the bottom of the screen. The DHC crosswalk tab lets you see tables provided in summary file 1 in 2010 and the corresponding tables in the DHC. The screenshot shows just the, the first few tables. If you compare the table number from 2010 with 2020, these are the columns on the left side, you can see if it is or is not included and if the lowest level of geography has changed. So if you look down through the, the column, you can see uh, P7, for example. I'll focus on P7. Um, give everybody a second to identify P7. It's about a third of the way down. So that left-hand column. P7 is Hispanic or Latino origin by race in the DHC, and it will be available in the DHC at the county level. In 20, the 2010 SF1, it was available at the block level, and you can tell by the, the, the label for that table. So P, it's a block table. PCO is a, is a um, county table. But it's important to note that these data are still available at the block level from the redistricting product. And the next few tables, P8 through P11, have been removed altogether. But again, these, these data are still available from the redistricting file. So if you take the redistricting file and the DHC as is proposed combined, you still have the data at the same level that you would have had it available at in 2010. And the fourth column shows the lowest level of geography that the table is being proposed for again for 2020. All right, so this is the right slide. So the DHC tables tab provides more detail about the table. And here you can see P1 through P4 and exactly what will be in those tables. So, and another tab for the demographic profile provides the same level of detail for the tables that will be in the demographic profile. Um, this is basically a, a table layout, so you can look and see for these tables how it will be set up, what race categories will be included in those tables. Um, format of those tables. So by starting with the DHC cro crosswalk, you can see the high-level names and the tables that will be included, and then you can use the crosswalk from the 2010 label to the 2020 label to go to this tab and then look and see more detail about what's going to be included in that file, in that table. 
So when a table is repeated for major race and Hispanic, Hispanic origin groups, the tables are identified with the letters A through I. These are the same major race and Hispanic origin groups data were repeated for in 2010. And these are listed on the right side of the slide. So you can see those, it includes white alone, black or African American alone, all of the main major OMB race groups alone, and then some other races alone, two or more races, and Hispanic or Latino, and white alone, not Hispanic or Latino. So the screenshot shows an example of a table that is repeated by these groups, P7, sex by age for five year and selected age groups. And you can see how you have the um, letter designation in, after the P7. And this is a table for uh, people who are Asian alone. This screenshot shows the demographic profile list of tables, which shows what tables from the DHC will be included in the demographic profiles. Then the demographic profile tab shows the details included in these tables, just as I showed you before. Okay, so that is how you can see what is planned for the DHC and the demographic profiles and the redistricting product specifications I said is already available online. So with what's already available online and with us providing you the specification, it will allow you to see what's being proposed for inclusion in the DHC and how it differs from what was provided in the summary file one in 2010. We of course still plan to have additional products. These will include census briefs and population and housing tables and special reports, which will provide additional analysis, visualizations and comparisons with 2010 data. And all of these are proposed to include data for larger places. And we include this slide to provide a summary of what we've covered in the previous slide. So the first block includes the tables that I focused on today, which will be supported by the current disclosure avoidance system. The next block includes tables that require complex person household joins, detailed race and Hispanic origin groups, and American Indian Alaska Native tribes and groups. And we continue to research ways to create public data products that include these tables that will meet user needs yet maintain data confidentiality. The next block includes tables that are mainly sourced from other tables. Then the PUMS file has its own block and we continue to discuss the release of a 2020 census PUMS file, which is unique because as I said, it's possible to release the entire protected file but at this point, it wouldn't include household joins or the other information that's not provided in um, the redistricting product or uh, the DHC. And the last two are the tables we are pr proposing not to produce. And thank you. I will now turn it over to Cynthia, who will complete the presentation. Thank you, Jason. Good morning, everyone. Now I'll take a little bit of time to update you, excuse me, update you on the outreach activities we've been conducting since our last briefing with you in the spring. We participated in several meetings and conferences providing these same updates as we've proceeded with the methodology for our data products. These meetings include PAA, a NAS panel on privacy protection, and a meeting with NCSL, just to name a few. Others are listed above. In addition, we've released information regarding the implementation status of the 2020 Disclosure Avoidance System. This includes the release of the, of the code base used for the 2018 end-to-end -end tests. John will provide a little bit more information on this at his presentation following ours. So I will just take a little bit just to highlight the expansion of the 2020 census memo series to now include formal decisions on the implementation of the DAS for the 2020 data products. It's actually the last bullet on this slide. The 2020 census memo series documents significant decisions, actions, and accomplishments regarding the 2020 census program. To date, we have two decision memos that are available publicly at that link. And those two decision memos are one specifically on the parameters of the DAS for the 2018 end-to-end -end test. And as Jason just mentioned, the implementation of the disclosure avoidance system on the data after we release the apportionment. So basically at the start of the redistricting data. We'll continue to conduct outreach and, and gathering feedback throughout the remainder of this calendar year. The list above shows confirmed upcoming meetings and their respective dates. 
for example, and this was something that was recommended by this group um, in the spring, we're beginning our formal consultations with the American Indian and Alaska Native tribal leaders. And we'll actually conduct that next month. As Jason sort of teased you with, we're also sponsoring a two-day NAS panel workshop, which is currently scheduled for December of this year. We're still in the beginning planning stages of that workshop, but I'll just take a few moments to give you the focus and how we plan to proceed. The workshop will continue to provide an opportunity for discussions and data collecting data user feedback on use cases and their needs for the 2020 data products and to help us identify and assess the technical solutions for the development of the remaining data products as well as fine-tuning the existing methodology. CN staff will convene a multidisciplinary group of experts to serve as the planning committee for this workshop, of course, in consultations with the Census Bureau. In addition, this workshop will allow presentations on the release of the release and the assessment of the 2010 demonstration products. So you've heard us tease you a little bit about that. So the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that will be the focus of the workshop in December. So we plan to release a set of data products that demonstrate the computational capabilities of the current DAS system. The current version of the DAS will be run on the internal 2010 data, known as the CEF, and we'll create two specific data products to be packaged in this demonstration product. One will be the PL94, as specified with the release of the 2018 tests, as well as the dem demographic and housing characteristics, or DHC file that Jason just went through. It's actually selected tables from that product and it is based on the current methodology for DAS. So the tables we can support, that's what we plan to release running the DAS on the 2010 data. This will allow the data user community to assess the impacts of the current methodology. Our target release date is mid-October, so next month. And as Jason pointed you to that spreadsheet that identifies the tables within the DHC, we'll be creating this, a very similar spreadsheet, so it will identify which particular tables are included or will be included in the 2010 demonstration product, as well as the PL tables and the specifications. And we're continuing the work on the release strategy of this, so stay tuned for more information to be provided very soon as we work out the details. Um, again, it will be released publicly, so it will allow all data users to do assessments, while the focus of the workshop will be selected presentations, we'll still be gathering feedback from the general public. We're continuing to work out those details of what that process looks like. So we'll keep briefing you. Thank you. Thanks, and you had some um, good questions there. Can you back up to the questions? I just want the rest of the folks to see them. About critical needs and um, ideas for outreach, I think um, each one of us represents some constituency with a different angle, um, so uh, we can be really helpful um, in this, um, and other concerns I'm sure will come up in the um, in the discussion. So one, um, I love the spreadsheet. It was very helpful. Um, the, um, I think looking um, from your description about the large set of inputs you have to sort of synthesize and hard, I am sure there is someone in the country who thinks that every table is a must have. Um, so I think the criteria is a really um, hard one to sort out the trade-offs. Um, uh, I'd love to, these are just some questions we can talk about during your response, but I'd love to hear if you actually have any feedback from the publishing of the prototypes um, from the redistricting file um, themselves, um, the, uh, I, the dissemination plan for the 2010 um, 
data project, you mentioned the workshop, so I didn't connect the two, um, the two pieces, so I think that's really, that's really helpful, but obviously only some people will be at the workshop, so thinking about, I mean, um, some of, you'll see throughout the presentation, a lot of my focus is on getting the word out to different types of users, so thinking about um, other academics or other people around the country that can't um, attend the workshop in person, not everyone is in DC. Um, and then I think it's a little hard to comment on the timetable when it's like everything will be explored, you know, um, on the SF1 and other pieces that are harder. Um, so I think people will be um, really interested in seeing that. I saw like last, last time the SF1 was released about a month after the demographic profiles what, in 2010. So the idea that this is gonna be like significantly longer, if this is you know six months later or something like that, getting people um, uh, prepped for data uh, later than they expect. Um, people plan way ahead of, um, in, in preparing these data. So if you expect the releases to be much later, that would be good to know earlier than, um, uh, than later. But I think the prototype files are fantastic. Um, and in the end, people wanna know like, how is this affecting what I need to do? <laughs> so um, similar to the, um, uh, to the same messages we heard in the outreach piece, you know, they don't care about the 2020 census, but they want to know like how it affects money in my community or how does it affect my, um, my needs and work. So I think the list that you had on the um, piece um, is great. I do, um, I was uh, disappointed to see that it's still really academic focused. Um, and maybe you've done outreach to all these folks and you just couldn't list everyone. So um, that's um, totally possible. Um, I think that the, um, we saw the, um, there was a comment letter from the National Congress of American Indians. Um, so that I was really pleased to see that the tribal consultations will be going forward and I think those will be um, a difficult path. I have um, experience in the um, shortcomings of the tribal data um, that exist already. So I think that will be, um, it's gonna need to have a lot of conversation. Um, and the other NAC constituencies can definitely um, help chime in on the, um, the impacts of the fewer tabs on the race um, and ethnicity um, pieces. But I, um, some of this too, we had a, uh, recommended analysis of the Federal Re Register about who, who you got answers from. Um, so the, um, and whether these folks were, were adequately represented in a Federal Register process, which is not really an inclusive process, obviously. Only some people are gonna um, uh, follow, follow that pieces. Um, I did think, you know, we heard a lot yesterday about your really extensive uh, customer relationship management program and the partnership program with, I don't know, 20,000 groups. And um, I, I think, the, and the um, thinking about what is the dissemination strategy? How can you leverage all this great work on the outreach um, to get feedback on the products? So it seems like it's really hand, being handled separately in silos, but all of those people, I mean, a subset of those people, honestly, who are interested in outreach will also be interested in using the data. Um, and you have the list already, and they're listening to you already in a really friendly, trusted way. Um, so it seemed like a really ready-made vehicle um, to get that out. Um, and I know the partnership specialists have a lot on their plate, but um, using the dissemination specialist platforms or other pieces um, to do that outreach, because we know that partnership um, pieces, I mean, the partnership representation is much more diverse than the folks that would you know, watch a CSAC live stream, for example, um, uh, that's here. I also think that, um, well, I'll, I'll skip that piece and go. So just on to some specifics, because I spent some time on the, um, and some of this I now realize is not um, correct, but I, thinking about the specific pop, only a, f you know, a pretty small number of tables were not included. I mean, the, the no's, you know, were, um, uh, there's some usability questions I would rec uh, I would recommend changes on the spreadsheet, which I'll send you separately. Um, one, uh, one, for example, about whether the table is available on ACS. So I think one of the questions is where else can I get this data? Um, 
uh, for people that are looking at it. So it would be helpful if there's a comparable table on ACS. And I didn't do the crosswalk, but um, uh, because that would be another place for people to go. Um, and some of these I also uh, recognize might be um, uh, solved, resolved, represented in future data products that we don't know about yet. So this is just seeing which ones um, had, uh, were difficult to produce under the current, under the new system, sort of gave, uh, you know, foreshadowing of the issues that you will be facing when you actually, um, when we actually see the SF1 proposed tables. Um, and what, one of them was um, uh, some of the tape, um, I don't for all of you who are dug into the um, into the tables of the SF1, the, there's often tables on own children, on related children, um, and all children. So obviously folks that are interested, we heard a lot yesterday about how there's increased complexity of family types. So um, having less information about that will um, have, um, may have, you know, implications for folks that are both serving children um, or analyzing the, uh, the demographers in the room can speak up about um, what they need to know about uh, changing family structure. Um, another example was um, the household type by relationship for people 65 years and older. And I was thinking about the massive um, concern about elder care and home health needs and, um, and how that might affect people thinking about the um, uh, senior services from a city perspective, for example. If, um, uh, so for every one that was cut out, I could imagine a use case. One, another one had um, ages three to four pulled out, like so people who are interested in school readiness. So um, I, the race of that detailed combinations I have since looked and will be available, right, on the PL, on the redistricting file, the, dif the multiple race co combinations. So that was my mistake on that one um, and the tribal listings we mentioned. Um, there are going to be fewer tables by race, so we know less about um, uh, racial disparities um, and differences in conditions for racial groups. Um, and I understood on the last one that we just needed to update the 2010 methodology um, that there was uh, just needed to be updated on the documentation and the spreadsheet. So I think that the community, I know that your head is in the stats and the, and the documentation, but the communications planning really should be valued. The, the data user groups should be valued as, and um, you know, thought about their communications and you can leverage a lot of what has they've already done around privacy, uh, around the needs for privacy and the, what we know from CBAMs um, that people value. So you are, um, you are building this on a reason that people have already said they value around the privacy of information. Um, it's just really hard. I can imagine it's gonna be really hard to follow. So this is more like what I would want for my constituency, like some easy, page where like the information about data products is there. So the memos like 57 pieces down that are really complicated um, was hard to find. Even finding the PL um, technical documentation file took a bunch of searches for me on the Google when I had on the, um, through Google when I had the title. Um, so I think this is you know, having some, I mean generally just being more transparent and putting things in an easier to um, uh, access format would be helpful. And I'm mainly thinking ahead for you through all of these different products too. Um, I think being upfront about these, I know there's been some um, communications, lay communications around differential privacy, but thinking about just a blog about like, these are really hard, there's gonna be trade-offs and these are really hard. So with releases of um, the DHC, for example, or others, um, I think um, bringing that into the conversation for users, um, uh, it's, it's pretty understandable. So um, uh, see the trade-off. So um, yeah, I would just be upfront with the users about what you're facing, I think. Um, and I did try to find stuff on the uh, 2020 Census Research Operational Plans and Oversight, which is where I think the products page should be. Um, uh, and right now it's just everything is too buried to even find out what's happening. I think the, you know, this is just the actual data file. The vast majority of your users don't, 
aren't even thinking about the 2020 data yet, right? So um, uh, trying to just get it on their minds now. So they're not surprised when the data comes out and their favorite table's missing. Um, I think the, uh, the, I think the layout of the, um, your slides earlier about the inputs that you're using were really helpful. I, I wanted more, um, not just the inputs, but some synthesis from this, like what, uh, what caused you to n not do the tables that you had? Was it just methodological that the differential privacy didn't work? Was it that no one has ever accessed that table on American Fact Finder? So, um, uh, so you don't, or, and you didn't get a use case in the Federal Register, so you, d you really have the evidence to say that this table can be cut without um, repercussions. I wanted more about the reasoning, um, uh, and I think that will help also, I saw some, uh, the Kids Count public comment that came through, um, I forget which state, um, because people are afraid all the data is going to be taken away sort of without thought, um, and it, there is a lot of thought going in, so um, as much rationale as we can provide um, to show that it's really evidence-driven and based on the input. So th describing the input in some lay format would be helpful, um, how you're making decisions, um, and then as you do make decisions, um, uh, you know, some of what your thought process were, if you could. Um, and I did this plug before, but we made a, um, Changing from the um, long form to the American Community Survey was also a wrenching, horrible process for people on the ground. Um, and I know a bunch of people in this room like live through that pain and suffering. Um, so we, we know how to do this. And um, the ACS user's guide, the, um, using the ACS user's group as one of the dissemination pieces, um, thinking about um, sort of post-release, how, um, how you're going to share this with users and guidance would be, um, would be really helpful, because um, I found those helpful during that former process when we were um, doing the adjustments. Um, so I think that's, um, I think that's all. So um, overall, I'm, I forgot to even start with, like I'm very excited to think about data. The data coming out of it, I feel, obviously the, Census is important for representation and for um, funding, but um, actually finding out more about our communities is the, um, uh, for many of us around the table who are researchers, the fun part. So I'm um, really, so thinking about these ahead of time was, um, I really enjoyed um, going through things. So thank you for all the work so far. Um, and I don't know if you wanna comment now or there's, I'm sure other people have questions too. So thank you, Catherine, for such great comments. And I will try and answer sort of one set of them and, or respond to one set of them. And then uh, uh, Cynthia can, can respond to uh, sort of another set. So um, I think your first, your first uh, point, you mentioned the large set of inputs, the large amount of inputs and the hard decisions we had to make. Um, so the input we received from the FRN, you know, combined with our own subject matter, um, knowledge, it kind of supported the idea that once you move beyond the legally mandated products, there still is a lot of really important uses for all the other tables that we provide. And, you know, we went through the, like the hit rates, you know, from the internet pages. We also looked at, through the FRN, we received data from the University of Minnesota's NHGIS. Oh, great. They provided hit rates to tables that they maintain. Oh. Yeah, and we, so we went through that and we tried to find, and we really tried to find like actionable sort of differences in hit rates. And it's hard because every, you know, every file gets in and it, it sort of regresses through the, the broad, you know, the sort of total population files get a lot more hit, hits than you know, when you go into the details. But you don't want to discount the small number of hits for some of the detailed populations because those tables are really important for those groups. Um, but as we worked through this and we worked through and we know we had the PL, which is mandated. And then we started looking at how we could formulate the DHC. A sort of, I guess, natural break emerged from, um, based more on the, the risk that each variable presented from a disclosure avoidance perspective. Um, that kind of created this, this, this distinction between what we could support in the DHC, which is what you see in the specification and what had to kind of be moved to other products. 
So in kind of this first sort of set of, of tables, it was mostly, and, and there were some small changes we made because we, there are some tables you could look at and you could see the uses were, were lower and we couldn't really come up with, we didn't know of good use cases, but those were just a few of those. Um, but for the most part, yes, it was sort of the methodology was pushing these more detailed tables, these complex house to join tables into sort of a later product so that we could still maintain accuracy with this first set of products, but then work on these other products as well. And I can also address one of your other comments about like the increased complexity of family types. And it's kind of a, a as we've worked through this, it's, it's a little different than in previous decades where we would produce the data and protect it and you'd have all the variables to kind of work with and you could formulate the tables the way you wanted to late in the process. With differential privacy, you have to sort of build, like so if you want a table that has age, uh, households for, with people of a particular age, you have to sort of build that into the disclosure avoidance system up front uh, because you're, you're, you lose this, this connection between members of the household and um, um, their family members. So that's, that's something we had to contend with for the DHC and then these other tables will be uh, part of another uh, differentially private solution. Um, trying to, to go through, I wrote a lot of notes from your comments and you, you covered a lot of ground. Um, I think the timing of the DHC will probably be closer to what you saw in 2010 for the SF1, just because it's, it's part of this initial build. The same, the same disclosure avoidance system will protect the PL product and the DHC tables. Um, yeah, and I think with that, I'll, I'll let uh, Cynthia talk a little bit about the outreach aspect of, of your comments. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, for your comments. I appreciate those. One thing I should have pointed out about the planned workshop is that we do plan to um, webcast it live, so for those who cannot attend in person, that they can still experience the, the workshop. And also, with the fact we're grabbing, this planning committee is representative of all various backgrounds so that they know who their people are and who they should go to in their constituencies. That was the, f the point of grabbing this group for the planning committee. So we should be able to get more ideas from them as well and be representative. Um, and then Jason already pointed out with the release schedule, we're trying as best as we can to keep the same release schedule as we did in 2010, at least for, um, definitely for the PL, because we're mandated, um, and apportionment data, and also for the DHC. But as we continue to finalize the methodology for the remaining products, our goal is to try to stick to the schedule that we've had in the past as best as possible. But we will be transparent about that and be very open and communicate that. Um, the other thing I just wanted to touch on is, yes, we, we do outreach and, and talk to various groups. Um, but when you mentioned the ACS users group, we do sort of have a lead-in with the Population Reference Bureau, so we work very closely with them um, and provide them information, gain feedback, and we're trying to, as we com complete the details of how to get input based on this release, we will include that group, too, so that they can get get that information out to the ACS data users group. Yep. Okay. So I don't know if things are We're working on it. Thank you. Great. Um, we'll have some more questions. And um, I just want to echo what um, what Kathy said. Um, you know, uh, this is the kind of thing that is just freaking people out, right? And, and um, you know, the, the model of how you all did it with the ACS was, was just brilliant. Those users' guides are fantastic. I love that they're specific by audience. Um, really, really incredibly helpful. So um, just want to echo that, that recommendation from her. Um, Michelle. Yeah. Okay. This is Rochelle Winkler. Um, 
Uh, I just want to say thanks for the really detailed presentation. I, lo I love all the tables that you provided in the shell, and you guys are obviously doing a lot of hard work on a really difficult topic, so thank you. Um, I have a couple questions. One is uh, probably a pretty easy one to answer. Um, it's regarding uh, the research data centers and the RDCs, and I'm wondering if uh, the full data or how is DAS going to be implemented in settings like that? Will people still be able to access data at those centers? Um, and then my other question, uh, you talked about a little bit in the presentation more than I saw in the materials we were provided ahead of time about PUMs. And I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more about um, I don't know if there are any timetables for when those files might be released. Um, it sounded like uh, individuals will no longer be able to be nested within households. I just wanted to understand that a little bit better. Um, and I think you also mentioned something in the presentation about um, some of the variables may not be available in the PUMS file. Um, and so I, I'd just like to hear a little bit more detail on that. Thank you. Did, did John want to answer that? John. Let me start with the FSRDC question. At the moment, research in the FSRDCs cannot access the census edited file from 2010. It accesses the version that was prepared for uh, internal research analysis known as the 100% detail file, which has had disclosure avoidance applied to it. So uh, we have a continuing commitment to make the research, the, the resources of the Census Bureau available in FSRDCs, but we don't at the moment have an equivalent of the HDF for the 2020 uh, CEF. So we're gonna have to experiment with the method by which the 2020 census edited file would be accessed in the FSRDCs. That's not a no, that's, a, that's sitting there with the public use micro sample, uh, which is where I'll go next. Um, the technology being used to, to do all the products that Jason and Cynthia just discussed is the top-down algorithm, which was the first production algorithm that we developed for implementing formal privacy on the 2020 census. Uh, enhanced to cover separately tables about housing units and tables about persons. Okay. The science didn't exist at the time we developed those production algorithms to do persons within households or to do detailed race and ethnicity. So at the time that these products that they just discussed were isolated from the bulk of the other products, we were working with uh, production system, or basically a beta production system, let's be honest, uh, uh, with a known scientific solution. Since then, uh, peer vetted scientific solutions for race and ethnicity, detailed race and ethnicity, and for join tables have been developed. And they, uh, we have led a contract to use those systems to develop the products that Jason and Cynthia were talking about that are outside of DHC. We can't provide more details about that right now because we haven't uh, examined the prototypes from production versions of that science. But uh, essentially, the internal team is very familiar with uh, the science that underlies those algorithms and not familiar at all with the production implementations. Um, if you want to look in the scientific literature, we are talking about a system known as ECTLO and PrivSQL. Uh, in particular, PrivSQL solves the join problem, but it does so by requiring that the analyst uh, specify a slightly more detailed version of the differential privacy policies that apply to the tables. So our own analysts need some experience in doing that before they can uh, get comfortable with the, with the output. In addition, neither of that technology does not deliver microdata to a tabulation system. So we had to agree to relax the assumption, relax the requirement 
that the disclosure avoidance system had to produce microdata. It will produce the tables that are, that are requested, but so now we need a publication engine that can disseminate the tables without passing them through our own tabulation engine. That is also a component of the contract that we just let. So uh, we have uh, made considerable progress, but appropriately are not able to give this committee or anyone else specifics about that until, first of all, those contracts have to start and they haven't started yet. So, uh, um, and then the work product has to be delivered, has to be reviewed by the people inside the Census Bureau who are responsible for that and then we can begin uh, discussing it publicly. That was a longer answer than I think you were expecting, but I, I think this committee in particular needs to understand what, what the plan is in some detail and I hope that was helpful. Uh, this is Rochelle. Yeah, I just want to say thank you very much. I appreciate the detail. And um, the, the big picture that I'm going to take away from it is I think you understand the importance of those issues and you're working on it and you have some good plans and they're in process. Great. Juan Pablo. All right. This is Juan Pablo Rocat. Thank you, Cynthia and Jason, for your presentation. Um, I had a, just a suggestion to um, try to expand the set of users in the future and take advantage of the decennial and all the um, visibility that the census will have uh, this coming year to, to do that. And I think one way that could be done is to think of all the, the growth in data science, data analytics, information visualization, uh, academic programs and courses that are that are out there now. Uh, these are typically the textbooks that are used and the people who teach those courses are typically not super familiar with census data. Uh, but I think census data is ideal for those courses. It's very interesting. Uh, it's free data. There's a lot of data. Um, and I think it might be uh, an opportunity to, to expand the set of people who are familiar with, uh, with census data products and, uh, and make them appreciate them and hopefully use them later in, in ways that haven't been used. So that might, I don't know, it's not something to me it's not a must, but it, it's an interesting opportunity. So, so uh, we, we absolutely, uh, Ali Ahmed, uh, Associate Director for Communications, we absolutely find it to be a very exciting and interesting opportunity. And um, we went over um, the integrated communications contract yesterday. I don't know if there was a separate slide calling it out, but we do have a sort of a data dissemination plan, which understandably is something that we are starting now and we'll be reviewing as it going forward. So we look forward to sharing those details with the committee in the future. But uh, we see that opportunity too, and, and we plan a, a robust plan to really reach out and try to expand the number of people looking at uh, census data. Ken? Ken Simonson. Uh, following on uh, Kathy's uh, recommendation for reaching out to private sector groups, I'd recommend, Cynthia, that uh, you include the Housing Statistics Users Group that the National Association of Home Builders hosts periodically. It gets together both uh, trade associations and uh, research organizations, such as the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Statistics. Oh, Chris. Chris Moore. I am real interested in data about um, children and youth, and it looks like um, it's quite promising, single year of age and age breaks. And I'm not in, in immediately familiar with table A1, <laughs> so I wanted to just follow on the cross tabulations. It looks like a three variable cross tabulation will be provided, and I'm wondering at what level of geography that will go down to. We're going to see if we can bring back the, the slide, because I think, was that one that slide was 20, visible on the slide? Slide 22. Slide 22. It's uh, race by sex by age group. So this is a later table, but I think you had asked about single year of age, and that was 
a track level table up to, well, I think a block, block level table up to age 20 and then single year of age at the track level. Right, and, the, and those look like count data. Those so they're be, not would, cross tabulations by additional variables. I think the table has its, as your, yeah, it's by sex, but it's not crossed by anything. Uh-huh. Unless but, it's, uh, the tables that have the asterisk by them, they're the ones that are iterated by, um, by the race, race, race groups. groups. So, so there will be cross tabulations with these age categories. Is, uh, no, okay, like, like for example, family structure. No, not in this, not in this release. I think she's okay. talking. This is Cynthia. Not in the current version of the DHC right now. No, they do not exist. We're still working on a solution for the detailed race and the family household joins. Okay, so, so this, this slide 22 is, could you say more about what is? This looks pretty good. No, this, but. Yeah, so it, well, it's, it's, I'm sorry, but it's difficult to kind of recall the tables and the details of the tables. Um, but this, this table, which is five year age groups, does show it by Asian alone. So this would be one of the sets of tables that would be iterated by race. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it, it's kind of difficult to recall the details of so many tables, but. That's one of the ideas of, of providing the, the specification so you can look and see exactly and what we provided in the specification is what we're proposing. There is no, you know, this was what it was in 2010. That, that specification provides what we're proposing for 2020. So if as you look through that table, if you have questions really about how to interpret the detailed tables when they're laid out um, in the spreadsheet, maybe follow up with us and we can, can provide you more information. So just to clarify, because this is sort of a big deal, is it, I know it'll be available at the national level, and at the state level, this kind of table, this kind of three-way breakout? So this table would be at the, the block level. The block, By okay. the age groups. Okay, great. But then there is a, a block level table with age, um, up to age 20 with single years, years of age. Let's see. Go ahead, John. John Chaika. I have a question about the 2010 demonstration products. Um, they're substantial. Are, are they going to be released with just based on one epsilon value, or and is that determined? <laughs> this is Cynthia. <laughs> Try this again. This is Cynthia. Yes, they will be released at one epsilon value, and we are in the process of determining what that epsilon value will be. It will be decided on at, um, that's a policy decision. Right. So once that is done, we will also release that information as part of our decision memo. But it will only be one epsilon value. Okay, and thank one you. Run. Okay, I had a question. So um, on the group quarters data for the redistricting file, so previously you didn't have that breakout, and so that meant that all those populations would be included in any block, but now having the breakout means the states can choose to exclude them or include them as they see fit. Is that what that means? I'm sorry, I missed that question. Can you repeat it, please? <laughs> sure. I know I talk really fast. So the group quarters data in the redistricting file, that you, you now have a breakout on that. Um, and so previously, I'm assuming that means that all those populations were in those counts. And John wants to answer this. And so now um, states can choose to exclude them or include them as they see fit. This is John About. I'm going to take that one because James Whitehorn is on uh, leave, unless he is on the car. I don't think so. So what happened in 2010 was that that particular table was produced in a publication, and you can find it on our 2010 uh, full page, called the Advanced Group Quarters Tabulation. So it was actually produced, and uh, states used that Advanced Group Quarters Tabulation uh, in combination with PL94171. Over the course of this decade, the redistricting office, in its negotiations with the National Conference on State Legislatures, uh, what they asked that that tabulation be included directly in the PL94 package. So it's the same table 
that was done in 2010. It's just now moved from a special publication, which was the advanced group quarters tabulation, into the PL94. And it's exactly the same table layout. Okay, that's great. And so, um, <clears throat> so it's not really a change, but, uh, but that's by having point. a breakout. Yes, it's not a change. Right. So by having a breakout, states can always include or exclude as they see fit. So, so I think it's always important to emphasize that the Census Bureau under Public Law 94-171 provides data to the states. It doesn't make any decisions about how those data will be used for the purposes of redistricting. So oh, yeah. no, I'm just trying to understand the functionality. Right, sorry. Because I'm, I'm a little slow. I was just trying to understand the functionality. Yeah. So it sounds like the answer is yes in terms of the functionality. They can yeah, in terms of the functionality, it's identical to 2010. Yeah, okay. Tommy, do you have a question? You know, I can't ask, Tommy, right? I can't ask questions, and I don't want to put my colleagues on the spot, but maybe I want to put the members of the community on the spot. So I, 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 I used to work with tables a long time ago in another life at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and they were transportation tables. And uh, I, are users, so this is a, maybe, are users really wedded to these tables? Must they, I could see some advantages, and everyone's looking at the same thing at the same time, so that, that could be an advantage. but. Does a user really want to say, I want access to everything in that lake. I want access to every response, and I want to form my own tables. Are you feeling this in some of the Federal Register notices? Does anyone, do we think about this this is way in the future? And also with this differential privacy and protection, would these accommodate these things? Or what do users really want? Are they, are, are they focused on these tables because we have been historically producing these tables? Do, does anybody say, I, I, I want to get at the data as much detail as I can? Because they have to, they have to learn how these tables are presented. So this is, as, as we said, this is very painful. So can the user just come to a website and say, I want in Prince George's County the number of males over 32? employed as engineers, <laughs> for example. I, it's, in the, it's, in the, it's, in the, it's in the underlying database, I mean, we, we, and, and for various things. We wouldn't be in the decennial census but, because engineers, but are users still talking about these tables? This is Rochelle. I just thought I'd respond. I think exactly what users would love to have is the kind of access that you talked about. I mean, at least um, a lot of your everyday kind of users, that's exactly what we'd love to have. And, you know, I remember um, years ago there was, um, I worked at a state data center and we had special access to this nice little website where we could go in and create our own little cross tabs that um, it's, it's no longer available and I don't remember the details about it, but um, I used that all the time because it was stuff that wasn't in the published tables, um, but I could create cross-tabs cross that, that were going to be useful to the partners we were working with. Um, and I think that kind of thing is exactly what users would love to have access to if it were available. Tommy, right, maybe it's a vision of some sort in the future. Where, are we ahead of schedule? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Go ahead, Jack. Um, Jack Levis, Tommy, what a great thought. Um, and I wanted, but I want to jump on that with um, what Juan Pablo was saying. The, it's almost like back up, what's the definition of the user right now? And my belief is that that's changing. In the last 10 years, um, or at least today, there are so many more data scientists, analysts, uh, call it whatever you want, in businesses everywhere. Um, and I'm, my gut is that, as Juan Pablo said, they're not aware of all of these tables right now. And with all that business intelligence and people who are going to want access to the data, they may dwarf the existing users that you're used to. It might make sense to do what Tommy said and step back and say, who are the users of the future and what are those users um, going to want? Because I can see it and I can feel it in my business where I was. I could see it in every place. Those are the calls I get. And so I think you need to think ahead as who is that next user? How do you give them access to the data? And what will they want? Because I'm pretty sure they're going to dwarf the users of 10 years ago. Go 
Kunal Tilwar, uh, CSAC. Uh, I guess I'll maybe respond to the second part of uh, Tommy's question, which is uh, how compatible is this with, uh, with privacy protection? Uh, and I guess, unfortunately, the answer is if you want users to be able to ask completely arbitrary questions, then there are, there's a mathematical theorem, uh, the database reconstruction theorem, which tells us that uh, we cannot allow reasonable accuracy for any possible question while still preventing reconstruction of the whole data set. Uh, that being said, I guess it's conceivable uh, and and in some sense even possible, uh, that if the user, if we restrict the kind of questions that the user can ask, let's say they can only ask two-way cross-taps or three-way cross-taps, then we may be able to do something. But uh, much as we would like to be able to answer completely arbitrary things, I think that's somewhat incompatible with privacy. Yeah, John. So a couple of comments. Uh, first, Rochelle, the product that you were using had three billion pre-tabulated tables preloaded that had all been through an automated disclosure avoidance system. So you weren't actually making a query on demand. You were doing what uh, Kunal said. You were operating from a set of uh, uh, legal. And if you had asked for something that wasn't in that inventory, admittedly a big inventory, you just would have gotten a, you can't have that. So, so, um, so what I was going to suggest is if, if the committee wants it, we should bring in people from our new Center for Enterprise Dissemination. It includes the SEDSI, the, the dissemination uh, unit that's in uh, the, the federal budget for developing uh, new methods of disseminating data, and it is the default production dissemination method beginning this month with the ACS one year releases and the new economic census releases. So you should uh, get more familiar with it. And it has a concept of operations that is very similar to what uh, Tommy laid out and to what um, Jack referred to, and I think to what you were doing when you were at the State Data Center. The idea is to go to data.census.gov and be able to ask a less structured query than give me table A00135 because I already know what's in it. And uh, so we'll still have the API for doing that because that's another way that users expect to be able to interact with the data. But data.census.gov, which is up, so you can, you can go there now, was designed to be much more um, user friendly and to uh, interact itself with the various data stores, including the APIs, to generate uh, candidate responses and allow you to go through. Those include uh, geospatial answers as well as uh, tabular answers. So I, th I think it might be very good to have uh, this group see something about said, si at the, uh, said and said si at the next uh, meeting if, if you want. Uh, I'm, I'm offering that. I, th I think it will answer many of the questions that were raised. Great. Um, anyone else? Thank you very much, Jason, and Cynthia, and everyone. Catherine, did this. We will move on to the next session. I should say that during this session, we might have uh, we might have the uh, it might overlap with the public comment at eleven. We'll now hear from John Avald and Tori Velkoff, who will present an update on disclosure avoidance, data products, and administrative data, and followed by an open committee discussion. Good morning, everyone. This is John Avald, and this is Tori Velkoff. Uh, we're going to lead with a video, so I, th I think we're ready. <laughs> it's the Michigan Notre Dame. You wish. Every 10 years, the U.S. Census Bureau surveys the American population. The ambitious goal is to count every person currently living in the entire United States of America and collect information about them like age, sex, race, and ethnicity. The whole purpose of doing surveys like the census, and many other big medical or demographic surveys, is to be able to get an overall quantitative picture of a particular population. 
How many people live in Minnesota? Or Mississippi? What's their average age? And how do these things differ in different places, or by sex or race? The results of the US Census are of particular political relevance since they are used to determine the number of seats that different states get in the US House of Representatives, as well as the boundaries of legislative districts from Congress down to city councils. But big surveys are also useful for understanding lots of other issues, too. The problem, of course, is that the census, like many other medical and demographic studies, is supposed to be private. Like, no one outside the Census Bureau is supposed to be able to look at just the published statistics about the US population demographics, and definitively figure out that there's a white, married, male 31-year-old with no kids living in my neighborhood. That's me. The Census Bureau is supposed to keep my information confidential. And they're supposed to keep the information of every single other person living in the United States confidential, too. Which is a tall order, because how can you keep everyone's information entirely confidential while still saying anything at all based on that information? The short answer is that you can't. There's an inherent trade-off between publishing something you learn from a survey and maintaining the privacy of the participants. It might seem like you could just remove people's names from the spreadsheet or only publish summaries like averages and totals, but it's easy to reconnect names to datasets using powerful computers. And there's a mathematical theorem that guarantees that every single piece of accurate information that you release, however small it seems, will inherently violate the privacy of the participants to some degree. And the more information you publicly release, the more you violate the individual privacies of the participants. But how do you quantitatively measure something nebulous like loss of privacy? And then how do you protect it? To understand how to measure privacy, it's helpful to start by imagining how somebody would try to use published results from a study and piece together the private information of the people surveyed. They could just try to steal or gain direct access to the private information itself, which of course can't be protected against mathematically. That requires good computer security, or physical defenses, so we won't consider it here. The kind of privacy attack we can defend against mathematically is an attack that looks at publicly published statistics and then applies brute force computational power to imagine all possible combinations of answers the participants could have given to see which ones are the most plausible. That is, which ones fit the published statistics the best. Imagine checking all possible combinations of letters and numbers for a password until one of them works. Except, instead of letters and numbers, it's checking all possible combinations of the answers that 330 million people could give on their census questionnaires, to see which combinations come closest to the publicly published figures for average age, racial breakdown, and so on. The more closely a potential combination of answers matches the published figures, the more promising a candidate it is, from the attacker's perspective. The more poorly it matches, the lower their level of certainty. As a small example, if there are seven people living in a particular area, and you tell me that four are female, four like ice cream, four are married adults, three of the ice cream lovers are female, and if you also give me the mean and median ages for all of these categories, then I can perfectly reconstruct the exact age, sex, and ice cream preferences of everyone involved. I would start with the three ice cream loving females. Even though there are hundreds of thousands of possible combinations of ages for three people, only a small fraction of those, 36 in fact, are plausible. They're in the right combination to give a median age of 36 and a mean age of 36 and two thirds. And the same thing works for the four females overall. There are almost 100 million possible combinations of ages they could have, but only 24 age combinations that are consistent with a median of 30, a mean of 33 and a half, and with at least one of the plausible age combinations for the three ice cream lovers. Continuing on with this kind of deduction leads to a single plausible and perfect reconstruction of all the ages, sexes, and ice cream preferences of the people involved. A 100% violation of privacy. If, however, you didn't list how many of the ice cream lovers were female, there would instead be two plausible possibilities, so I would be less certain which was the true combination of ages and genders and ice cream preferences. And if you published even less data, there would be an even higher number of plausible possibilities, so I would be even less certain. And the potential level of certainty of an attacker is precisely how we measure the loss of privacy from publishing results of a study. If all possible combinations of ages and sexes and so on are similarly plausible, then an attacker can't distinguish between them very well, and so privacy is well protected. But if a small number of the possibilities are significantly more plausible than the rest, they stand out, and precisely because they stand out on plausibility, they're also likely to be close to the truth. So to protect privacy, all possibilities need to seem similarly plausible, or at least there can't be plausibility peaks that are too conspicuous. The potential for plausibility peaks is quantified mathematically by measuring the maximum slope of the graph. If the slope never gets too steep, then you can't have any sharp peaks of highly plausible possibilities that stand out. 
But how do we publish statistics in a way that limits the maximum slope, and possible peaks, on the plausibilities plot? In practice, the best way to limit an attacker's ability to confidently choose one scenario over the other is to randomly change, or jitter, the published values. Like, for example, rolling a die and adding that number to the average age reported for ice cream lovers. Jittering the published results in a mathematically rigorous way puts a limit on the slope of the plausibility graph, and thus makes it harder for any particular possibilities to stand out above the rest. Jittering results might also seem like lying, but as long as the size of the adjustment isn't big enough to make any significant changes to conclusions you could draw, then it's considered worth it for the privacy protection. For example, imagine I want to give you a sense of my age while keeping my true age secret. If I just told you my age, obviously there's just one plausible possibility. 31. But suppose instead that I secretly pulled a number between minus 5 and 5 out of a hat, and added it to my age before telling you. In this case, all you know is that my true age is somewhere within 5 years of the number I told you, but you don't know my age exactly. My privacy has been preserved, though only to a certain degree, because you can be confident I'm not 20 and not 40. To protect my age more, I'd have to pull a number between, say, minus 10 and 10 out of a hat and add it to my age. This increases the number of plausible possibilities, that is, the possible true ages that could have resulted in the number I told you. It also increases your uncertainty about my actual age. The trade-off for privacy is inaccuracy. If I wanted you to know my age within a year, I could only pull a number between minus 1 and 1 out of the hat. In general, the idea is this. More privacy means you get less accuracy. Less privacy means you can have more accuracy if you do things right. When you publish results, hopefully there's a sweet spot where you can share something useful while still sufficiently maintaining people's privacy. And simultaneously maintaining decent privacy and decent accuracy gets easier and easier with larger datasets. Like how as I add more noise to this image, you can still get the general picture even once you've lost any hope of telling the true original value of a particular pixel. So to protect people's privacy, we can and should randomly jitter published statistics, which the US Census, for example, has been doing since the 1970s. However, there's a subtlety. You can't just add any old random noise however frequently you want. If I simply add different random noise to this picture a bunch of times, once you take the average of all the noisy images, you basically get back the original clean image, and you don't want this happening to your data. So there's a whole field of computer science dedicated to figuring out how to add the least possible amount of noise to get both the most privacy and the most accuracy, and to future-proof the publication of data so that when you publish multiple jittered statistics, they can't be combined in a clever way to reconstruct people's data. But up through the 2010 census, the Census Bureau couldn't promise this. Sure, they were jittering the figures published in Census Bureau tables and charts, but not in a mathematically rigorous way. And so the Census Bureau couldn't mathematically promise anything about how much they were protecting our privacy or say how badly it's been violated. Until now. The 2020 census is a different story. It will, for the first time, be using mathematically rigorous privacy protections. One of the biggest benefits of the mathematically rigorous definition of privacy is that it reliably compounds over multiple pieces of information. Like if we publish both an average age and median age, each with a privacy loss factor of 3, then the privacy loss factor for having released both pieces of information is at most 6. This means you can decide on a total cumulative amount of privacy loss you're willing to suffer, and then decide whether you want to release, say, 10 pieces of information each with one-tenth that total privacy loss and less accuracy, or if you want to release one piece of information with the full privacy loss and a higher level of accuracy. But how much privacy we need is a really hard question to answer. First, it involves weighing how much we as society collectively value the possible benefits from accurately knowing stuff versus the possible drawbacks of releasing some amount of private information. And second, even though those benefits and drawbacks can be quantitatively measured as accuracy and privacy loss, we still have to translate the mathematical ideas of accuracy and privacy loss into something that's understandable and relatable to people in our society. That's partly a goal of this video, in fact. So let's give it one more shot at a translation. First and foremost, it is in principle impossible to publish useful statistics based on private data without in some way violating the privacy of the individuals in question. And if you want to provide a mathematically guaranteed limit on the amount of privacy violation, you have to randomly jitter the statistics to protect the private data. The accuracy of the information after being jittered is generally described probabilistically, by saying something like, if we randomly jittered the true value for the population of this town a bunch of times, 98% of the time our jittered statistic would be within 10 people of the true value. So accuracy has two components, how close you want your privacy-protected statistic to be to the real answer, and how likely it is to be that close. 
The loss of privacy due to the publication of information is described in terms of how confidently an attacker would be able to single out a particular possibility for the true data. Given the published information, are there just a few possibilities for the true data, or are there many, many plausible possibilities for what the true data might be? Essentially, loss of privacy is measured by the prominence of peaks on the plausibility plot. And so the protection of privacy requires policing the possibility for such peaks. If we individuals are going to willingly participate in studies and surveys, or use services where we reveal potentially sensitive personal information, we should demand that the researchers or organizations utilize a mathematically robust way of protecting our privacy. Simply put, if they can't guarantee there won't be a peak in plausibility, then we shouldn't agree to give them a peak at our data. Thanks to the US Census Bureau for supporting this video. The founders of the United States understood that an accurate and complete population count is necessary for the fair implementation of a representative democracy. So a regular census is enshrined in the US Constitution. The US 2020 census will be the first anywhere to use modern, mathematically guaranteed privacy safeguards to protect respondents from today's privacy threats. These new safeguards will protect confidentiality while allowing the Census Bureau to deliver the complete and accurate count of the nation's population. They'll also give those who rely on census data increased clarity regarding the impact that statistical safeguards have on their analyses and decision making. In short, the Census Bureau views the adoption of a mathematical guarantee of privacy as a win-win. Now, of course, protecting census data from hacking is another question entirely. Anyway, here's how the chief scientist at the Census Bureau thinks about it. There's a real choice that every curator of confidential survey data has to make. If they want the respondents to trust them to protect confidentiality, then the curator has to be prepared to give and implement mathematically provable guarantees of privacy. Unfortunately, this means there's a constraint on the amount of information you can publish from confidential data. It's mathematically impossible to provide perfectly accurate answers for as many questions or statistics as you want, while also protecting the privacy of respondents. So curators need to do two things understand the needs and desires of the people who provided data and the people who want to use the data in order to determine precisely what balance of accuracy versus privacy to choose, and then not waste that limited privacy budget by publishing accurate answers to unimportant questions. If you're not familiar with minute physics, I invite you to go uh, listen to uh, Henry Reich's explanation of uh, relativity, space-time uh, uh, continuum, and uh, uh, many, many other concepts in physics. He is a PhD uh, physicist, and he was an academic physicist until doing uh, things like this uh, minute physics video on the census became his full-time uh, occupation. So. Um, we wanted to show you that, because it's brand new, it was just released yesterday, and uh, it is one of our attempts to make clear uh, the decision-making framework that's going on underlying the confidentiality protection and the, and, uh, the reasons why we have um, moved to a modernized system, which we've discussed here before. So I'll give the disclosure avoidance update, and I'll try to keep it short. Uh, this is actually a duplicate of one of the slides that uh, Cynthia showed you. It's the place where we are curating the, the current uh, code base, the code base that was used for the 18 end-to-end -end test, and also the, the place where the um, memos describing the decisions underlying that code base have been uh, memorialized. Right. I also wanted to briefly say, uh, because we've said this in several forums now, that uh, formal privacy methods for the American Community Survey will not be implemented before 2025. And uh, Ron has written a nice blog explaining that we uh, have our hands full with the 2020 census. And uh, uh, in the process of moving towards formal privacy for the American Community Survey, you can expect the same engagement of the user community that the wonderful documentation that Allison was uh, praising earlier uh, produced. So, so there was never any intention to do this with a hammer on uh, bludgeon. It was intended to be a collaborative process. But we have an awful lot of work to do for the 2020 census, and so uh, this notice is to, to tell the user community 
that we will be developing the collaborative way in which we uh, are open about our disclosure limitation modernizations for the American Community Survey over the course of the next several years, and nothing will be implemented before 2025 that involves formal privacy. That doesn't mean we're going to stop using the traditional methods or stop strengthening the traditional methods. That's exactly what we will continue to do. And those methods are not particularly transparent, so that's the uh, trade-off. Um, all right. So uh, the end-to-end -end test product used a collection of queries that had what computer scientists call a histogram, but there's far more social scientists in this room than computer scientists, a fully saturated contingency table uh, of 2012 cells at the national level. So that means that's every interaction of the variables that are used to form the redistricting data. All possible combinations are in that 2012 cell national histogram. All right. In order to uh, expand that, in order to do at the person level, the demonstration products that Jason and Cynthia just talked about, that fully saturated histogram uh, had to be adjusted this way, and I see actually there's a, an error in this slide. So that a ages single year all the way out to uh, the 115 to max that in, in the histogram that, that was dis discussed for the demonstration product. So that uh, aggregation is a, uh, was not in fact implemented. So that's the, that's the, the layout. So, HHGQ is uh, you're either in a household or in one of seven major GQ types. Race is the 63 OMB categories that are used in the PL94 data. Uh, Hispanic origin is Hispanic or Latino origin, yes or no. Sex is male or female. Age is single years out to 115. And uh, citizenship is in the prototype that was used for those products, but no citizenship tables will be released as a part of the demonstration. We wanted to make sure that the system could handle the CVAP product as it's being developed. Um, for the housing and households, the, the uh, fully saturated histogram is 387,072 cells and contains uh, householder attributes, race, ethnicity. So it's always OMB race when I say race, not detailed race. Um, race, uh, Hispanic origin, sex and age, and the age in the household level tables has been um, uh, grouped according to the uh, schema that Jason presented. Uh, Multi-generational status of the household, uh, household size top coded at seven, um, and the presence of people 60, 65, or 75 or over in the household and certain household type attributes that were also documented in the uh, table specs that Jason talked about. So uh, what this means is the, the uh, current version of the disclosure avoidance system, which happens to be running in full production mode as I speak, um, can handle these two setups. And these two setups are sufficient to produce Averages are not particularly useful here, but about 70% of the full DHC product. Uh, so um, the specs of exactly what will be released from this run on the 2010 data uh, will be developed over the course of the next month because as soon as that system stops running, it will be handed over to, uh, to Decennial and Demo to, um, to do the uh, quality control. I think that's coming up here. Yeah, so the demonstration products are based on the national 2010 census edited file. They cover about 70% of DHCP and DHCH. They're based on a workload of about 400,000 cell histogram or uh, uh, fully saturated contingency table. They use a new version of top-down, which we will also release in, uh, in beta mode in the same repository once we have finished developing the products. Um, in fact, the details of the uh, optimization of the privacy loss management budget were discussed yesterday at a DSEP meeting, but the results of that meeting have not been uh, released to the public yet. We're developing a communication campaign as the, uh, as the quality review goes. So I'm not going to tell you what the answer was, but when we all disappeared yesterday, or a healthy portion of us disappeared yesterday, it was to do two hours worth of how do you do the problem that the Minute Physics uh, video we led this discussion with says the curators need to wrestle with, and wrestle with it we did. Um, 
We have a soft release date for mid-October, and then the CNSTAT workshop that Cynthia gave you more details on will be in December. Uh, I don't want to give the impression that that workshop is exclusively for uh, any particular user community. It's also for uh, the privacy community. We, we want comments from all uh, potential um, interest groups about these products. And the, the, the new code base release will follow in October. Okay. You also asked for an update on administrative data. So, the bullets on this slide describe the Census Bureau's stated official policy <laughs> for how apportionment will be done. It's one of the primary data products from the 2020 Census. The apportionment counts are due to the Secretary, who then delivers them to the President by December 31st of 2020. That's a statutory deadline. The counts are used to reapportion the House of Representatives. The apportionment population count for each of the 50 states includes the state's total resident population, citizens and non-citizens, plus a count of the federal employees and their dependents living with them who are allocated to their home states. That process of determining who counts, who's a resident, has been thoroughly documented in Federal Register notices and the final Federal Register notice for the residence criteria for the 2020 census was published in February of 2018. The apportionment counts are calculated from an internal file known as the census unedited file, which is basically the raw census responses after they've come out of the decennial census response processing system and been unduplicated. So at the person level, the record count is fixed and the geo identifier, the first two digits of the geo identifier, the state in which you live, are fixed. They can't be further edited. So that means the count of persons within each state is fixed at that point. Right? There is no citizenship data in the cuff. Redistricting. PL 94171. Again, there have been multiple Federal Register notices stating the content of the PL 94171 file, it's produced by a statutory deadline of April 1st of 2021. The plan is to make these data available to the public, but specifically to states to assist in redistricting. These data are computed from the census edited file, which is produced from the cuff, but is not ready to be used for any purpose until late January 2021. Uh, at that point, um, the CEF is sent to the disclosure avoidance system that we've been talking about for the earlier part of this presentation. And that disclosure avoidance system releases a microdata detail file to the tabulation system. The tabulation system then begins computing the, uh, the production PL94171 data and by agreement that the redistricting data office has made with the various state redistricting offices, these data are released on a flow basis beginning on February 18th and running through the March 31st, 2021 statutory deadline. The format of the PL94171 data was actually done a little bit in the earlier one, but these tables are exactly the same format as the end-to-end uh, -end test product was in. So they are four population tables and uh, one group quarters population table and one housing unit count table. They, they have been reviewed by state redistricting offices in a continuous review process that is very public. It also has many federal register notices associated with it. And, uh, and that's the format in which the state redistricting offices are expecting to have the PL94171 data delivered. The citizen voting age population data so the Paperwork Reduction Act clearance package for the 2020 Census and the President's Executive Order 13880 commit the Census Bureau to releasing citizen voting age population, CVAP, data by March 31st, 2021. That is the same deadline as the statutory deadline for the redistricting data. These data will be produced by combining administrative data from a number of federal and possibly state agencies into a separate microdata file that will contain a best citizenship variable for every person in the 2020 census. The citizenship microdata file and the CEF will be simultaneously sent to the 2020 disclosure avoidance system, 
which will do the final record linkage and place a confidentiality protected citizenship variable on the same NDF as used to produce the redistricting data. It means that all of the codes have been harmonized. And then the CVAP data will be produced at the block level from the MDF and released to the public by March 1st of 2021. What's the format for the CVAP data? This slide doesn't have very much information in it. No final decisions have been made regarding the methodology and format of the block level CVAP data. To avoid any misinterpretation of that bullet, it will use the same codes as all the other publications from the 2020 census. So the block geocodes will be the same in that file as they are in the PL94 and as they are in the DHC. No decisions have been made regarding the future of the American Community Survey-based CVAP data that have been produced annually since 2021, since 2011, excuse me. The Census Bureau's internal working group has set March 31st, 2020 as the final date for determining the viability of potential administrative data sources on citizenship. That means if we can't determine whether it's useful by March 31st of next year, we won't use that particular administrative record source. A similar decision was made about administrative record sources for the processing of the 2020 census, and that decision was made last year. All right. March 31st, 2020 is also being used by the internal team as the date for specifying what a CVAP product would look like, even though that product will not be released until March 31st, 2021. At some point, you have to say exactly what you're going to tab tabulate and how you're going to do it. So that's the internal deadline for that. We're also considering but have made no decisions about demonstration products like the ones we've been talking about for the, uh, for the other data products. OK, so using administrative data. The Secretary's March 26, 2018 instructions, following them, we began doing modeling efforts that focused on having available two sources of data for citizenship. A survey response to the question that was um, proposed for and has no, but is not going to be included on the 2020 census, and administrative records. Once the Supreme Court upheld the injunction on asking the question, and the president issued Executive Order 13880, we had to shift those modeling efforts to using just administrative records. So it isn't a question of whether that's feasible. It's a question of how to ad adapt the, uh, the modeling efforts. And that's what's un underway right now. The director has convened the interagency working group, which consists of high-level executives and federal agencies that have uh, access to person-level data relevant to estimating citizenship. There's two primary uses for those data. One is keeping the names, addresses, and other PII in the record linkage system current. And the other is determining citizenship status, either from variables that are on the file or from eligibility conditions that uh, cause you to be on that file. I'll explain both examples in a second. Right. Here are the current sources of citizenship data uh, inside the Census Bureau. The, the file that we call the Social Security Numident which contains place of birth and citizenship status for about 94% of its universe, but its universe is not uh, the entire population of the United States. Individual taxpayer identification numbers. So I want to make clear that the Census Bureau does not receive and has not requested from the IRS the application form and other data associated with an ITIN. But an ITIN has a particular nine-digit numerical format which makes it possible to determine on another administrative record that the record was filed with an I-10 rather than a social security number. And I-10s are only issued to non-citizens. So that's an inference about a non-citizen that comes from knowing that the identifier is an I-10 and not an SSN. IRS forms 1040 and 1099, which are primarily used to keep the record linkage system current, uh, there's no actual citizenship information on those forms. CMS Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP data, which contain some citizenship information but are primarily used to keep the record linking system current. Housing and urban development data from the agencies I've listed there. Uh, and that bullet seems to not be formatted properly. That's the last one on the list. Uh, those are various um, data files from housing and urban development. I want to stress that 
We've had MOUs in place to acquire these uh, uh, administrative records for quite some time. They are used in um, other Census Bureau products. MOUs do not have an infinite lifetime. They have a fixed uh, length and they have to be uh, continuously um, serviced. The additional sources that we are seeking to get for federal citizenship data come from the Department of Homeland Security, from three agencies within uh, USCIS, CPB, and ICE, where we would get uh, lawful permanent residence and naturalization, visas, and arrival departure information. From the Department of State, where we would get from the Passport Services Agency passport data, from the Social Security Administration, where we have requested the master beneficiary record, from the Indian Health Service, where we have re requested uh, patient registration, and from the Department of Justice, and that, the, again, that bullet below that should be in the smaller font, um, U.S. Marshals and Citizenship and Immigration data. So those are the sources we are seeking to augment our system with. What does the research program look like? So, we have developed statistical models that efficiently and accurately combine multiple sources of administrative citizenship data to estimate best citizenship for each person known to what is called the Person Identification Validation System, PVS. That's the production record linkage system. That's the same record linkage system that the 2020 Census uses to ingest administrative records for the other purposes that it's using those records for. Um, these models are used to prepare a microdata file outside the 2020 Census production system that can be combined with the 2020 Census edited file to provide the 2020 Disclosure Avoidance System with that same best citizenship variable to then be used in, after it's been confidentiality protected to provide block level CVAP tables. This research began in April of 2018. Final specifications and model details are planned for release before March 31st of 2020. This is an internal deadline for planning purposes because it's necessary to map out the rest of the production system, so you have to have some point at which you fix the specs. All right. The rest of the research program enhances the record linkage capability. So the PVS can uh, link administrative data for about 90% of the U.S. resident population. A lot of that other 10% have uh, administrative records and they would be linkable if the system itself had the PII about these people for the record linkage. So many of the requested files from DHS, state, and others are primarily to expand the record linkage capability so that we can identify the uh, citizenship status of that remaining 10% of the U.S. resident population. Confidentiality protection. All administrative data ingested by the Census Bureau, including the data that we've just discussed, are protected and can only be used for statistical purposes. In addition, they are all covered by the Section 9, Title 13 confidentiality protections, which prohibit making any publication whereby the data furnished by any particular establishment or individual under this title can be identified. We are not allowed to publish the data in a format, and we have been discussing for the last 45 minutes our efforts to ensure that the 2020 publications, including any CVAP publication that we, that we release, satisfy that strict requirement of Title 13. The CVAP tables will be produced using the 2020 Census Disclosure Avoidance System, which implements differential privacy using top-down. The CVAP tables will share the privacy loss budget determined by the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee for the 2020 Census publications. So we will account for the privacy loss associated with the CVAP tables in the overall accounting of the 2020 Census publications. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any questions? We could start with, wasn't that a fantastic video? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, Kathleen sent an email to say that she thought it was just fantastic and, and uh, wanted to chime in on that as well. And um, kudos to Kunal, who found it last night and sent it to all of us. It's because we love the census and everything you do, and we want to see it the minute it comes out. So we're excited about that. Um, Okay, Andrew. Hi, Andrew Samwick. Um, 
thank you for that presentation. You know, I'm going to ask a very naive question. It, it was about what was on your last slide. I think I, I would benefit from a better understanding of what um, is meant by Title 13, Section 9. I'm thinking about it for like the data I'll submit to the census. Uh, I, I would wager that my family, because of its configuration of genders and ages and the block group where it lives, is probably identifiable if the record were ever seen. And then you would know things about us that you didn't need to know to identify us, maybe Hispanic origin. So I'm, I'm just wondering, does that mean that you can't release the information or it can't be discoverable even if it's not specifically attached to me, right? You just, you just simply couldn't identify an individual line, any, any household's record, right? No, you're not releasing my name, you're not releasing my address, but somebody clever could figure out that that was us and then learn things about us. So I guess I, I need a little more background on what the import of that title and section is. So Section 9 of Title 13 has been consistently interpreted by the Census Bureau as prohibiting the release of data even in tabular format whereby you could attach the correct name or name and address, however you want to think about it, to, to the record. Um, the earliest ways of implementing that protection had to do with looking at tabular summaries, seeing that the, it was only a single entity in a particular cell of a tabular summary, and saying, well, if you do this, it doesn't take much background information to figure out what that entity is. So at the block level, the average block had in 2010 had 30 persons in it. The average populated block had 50 persons in it. I don't know the household counts, but, but divide by um, two and a half approximately. So, 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 um, so that means that block level population statistics are almost entirely dealing with population uniques. So, so we haven't publicly released statistics like that, but we have said that block, sex, age, and single years, race and ethnicity is a population unique for more than half the population. And any additional attribute that you add to that list is just going to increase that proportion. So the working assumption is that virtually every household in the United States is a population unique at the block level, okay? So, so publishing block level data is extremely tricky. And the techniques that have been used historically to protect confidentiality got their uncertainty primarily from me not being allowed to tell you exactly what we did and stating in the technical documentation, which I refer you to, that we have done geographic swapping to protect the geospatial location and may have done other things. We often also give some characteristics of that geographic swapping. Uh, for example, in 2010, that it did not change the population totals in a block. So we have discovered through our research that failure to provide geospatial location to the block populations is a serious compromise of the confidentiality of the data, and we can't do that any longer. So in order to do that, we have included the block level geospatial location in the list of characteristics that are being protected by the formal privacy system. That means, essentially, to use minute physics language, every one of your characteristics and every one of the persons in your family's characteristics have been jittered, including where you were geospatially located in our database. Now, we don't do it record by record. We do it through a complicated algorithm that uh, I don't think your question was about. But it gets down to every single characteristic gets jittered, and it gets jittered enough to avoid 
um, re-identification attacks. The problem with quantifying re-identification attacks is that our old method of doing it was to try to, sp to specify exactly what the attacker was going to use, how much computing resources the attacker had, and what sort of outside knowledge he or she brought to the attack. So you specified that they had a commercial database with names and addresses in it that was current around 2010, say, and they had uh, sufficiently uh, sophisticated record linkage technology that could uh, map um, microdata that just contains a block ID and a sex and an age back to microdata that also contains a name and address. All right. So on that technology, we discovered that in 2010, if you had uh, done that, you would have been able to um, link about 45% of the population and you'd have been right about who they were 38% of the time. That is, um, was judged by DCEP to be an unacceptable uh, um, condition for 2020. We had to figure out how to provide better confidentiality protection, but that's just one of the many possible attacks. Using formal privacy says, again, in the language that, that the minute physics says, you're trying to control not the absolute re-identification rate because that depends on things that are out of our control, but the contribution that the data that we release make to that re-identification, to, to, to that particular, essentially, data science exercise. So when you turn the data scientists loose on the 2020 tables, their inferences about specific variables could be controlled by that epsilon that we specify for the, for the final products. And that's a worst case. So basically, if you're controlling the worst case, you're controlling all of the other cases. So worst case protection is what these systems are based on. And they're hard to build. They're hard to reason about outside of the uh, mathematical community, but they work. And so um, we're struggling to be good enough at reasoning about it so that we can explain what we did and maintain the confidence of people that this really does work. Uh, and uh, it's important that it work, and it's important that people believe us when we say we work, it works. Yeah, Kathy. Oh, oh, you didn't mean to have it up. Oh, okay. Uh, Kunal? Uh, okay, so I guess I had a, a bunch of things. So firstly, uh, the video was really great. Thank you for that. Uh, second, I also, also want to compliment you for the release of the code base. I think it's, uh, it's excellent practice uh, in the security community to make public what you're doing. Uh, and releasing the code base is, uh, is, is, I guess, clearly the right way to do it. Uh, I guess I had a couple of other questions. So first, uh, so you mentioned you're going to release the 2010 uh, data when passed through the disclosure avoidance system. I'm guessing this uh, disclosure avoidance system will be run on the original, uh, original data rather than the new one. Uh, and I guess that kind of raises the possibility of trying to do some comparison between uh, how the old disclosure avoidance system compares with the new one, uh, not just in terms of privacy, I guess that we know the old one was not, uh, not very good, uh, but also in terms of utility, since the new one actually allows you to do uh, Bayesian reasoning on top of it, for example. Uh, so perhaps doing some of those studies would be valuable. Uh, I guess one last comment I had was, uh, so I guess, in some sense, the citizenship data, I would say people consider it more sensitive than some of the other attributes. Uh, and it's also perhaps much more correlated across blocks uh, than some of the other attributes. So if you look at the distribution of the, say, fraction of non-citizens in a block, that's probably much more bimodal than, uh, than some of the other attributes. Uh, and this bimodal, this bimodal nature would, I would expect, make it much easier to mount a reconstruction attack uh, to reconstruct this attribute uh, 
than for a completely independent attribute. Uh, uh, all of which is to say that perhaps it makes sense to have a higher level of privacy guarantee for uh, this one attribute uh, compared to the others. Uh, and yeah, I wonder if you have thought about that, if it's feasible, I mean, I guess doing that may not be that hard. One could imagine just doing randomized response on this attribute before feeding it to the uh, disclosure avoidance system. Uh, so uh, yeah, I would, I would recommend that this be considered and Uh, thank you for those comments, and in fact, one of the charges I got from yesterday's DCEP meeting was to investigate the feasibility of putting extra uh, confidentiality protections on the citizenship variable. Cool. And that Thanks. is the technique that we're going to look at. See? Great minds. Thinking alike. Like, all right. John. John Chaika. Uh, this really goes beyond what's here, but, but there's a very interesting implication on your slide 54. Um, a, a big limitation of the Census Bureau's record linkage system is that it's only worked for people who had SSNs. It was, I think, perhaps recently extended to ITINs, but basically if you, you, you couldn't get a pick if you weren't in that, that database. And so, uh, the linkages that have been performed with the surveys typically leave 5 to 10 percent of the people unmatchable. Here, you're clearly creating linkage beyond the, the, the PVS system. Um, is the Bureau contemplating creating picks for these folks so that you could potentially expand that linkage in all future surveys? So we actually already do that. You can already get a pick, even if you don't have a social security number. And yes, everything, every person record that we ingest gets put through an anonymization routine that um, removes the name and address and replaces them with codes. Um, so so um, one of the byproducts of this research will be to enhance the PVS system. We're going to do the research outside of the production environment because that's the way you do it. And uh, uh, so uh, the, the citizenship variable will benefit from this research. The um, other production uses of administrative data in the 2020 census will be running on the production code that's uh, not locked, but it's in, in, a, in a, uh, a production process already. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, the, the goal is to, to expand our ability to link administrative records beyond people who have been issued Social Security numbers. Okay, that's great. Um, and, and it always seems like a good time to remind everybody that it's a one-way street, like you guys ingest the data, but then by law, there's no sharing it any other way, right? I, I know somebody knows that law name. I don't have it. Well, uh, Enrique, you know, I have a sort of a a cute way of saying it. The Census Bureau is the data roach hotel. Uh, <laughs> the, the data come in in identifiable form and they don't go out in identifiable form. So that's Krishna. Uh, Krishna Rao. Um, maybe this might have been a better, well, the last two presentations have been fairly linked. Um, it was interesting, I guess, thinking about all of this, We've talked uh, citizenship. The confidentiality seems su super important, even more so um, in light of these conversations about citizenship. Uh, part of this has made me think, though, a little bit about um, how people think about confidentiality and how well that maps. And maybe this is a little bit related to Andrew's question: how that maps to kind of how you guys are thinking about it internally. Which is, you know, I don't. Um, we have this nice set of theoretical results uh, that relates to tabular reconstruction and probabilistic things. On the other hand, I, I do think what people care more about is kind of being able to link themselves individually to their records. And you know, like it, I'm trying to think, 538 has a, a bot that tweets out in, a citizen from the census. And, and no one, everyone seems like it's kind of cool to get a bunch of data on that. And, and so I, I guess we'd love to understand the degree to which 
we have, we have the ability to guarantee privacy formally using this definition, how close we think this definition actually matches what we think people are concerned about. Are, you know, are we looking under the light post where we have light for our keys, even though they might be somewhere else, um, just because this is where we have lots of light and we can do things that are much more rigorous, but maybe there is a little bit of a delta between the theory of what we can do and what we actually have advances on versus what individuals, what matters most to individuals and kind of their expectations about privacy and what that does and doesn't mean. So we actually have a research program addressing the question that you just raised uh, in the Center for Behavioral Science Methods. They have uh, already field tested the questionnaire and uh, they'll be uh, doing the production surveying over the, over the course of the last half of, of this calendar year. Uh, the basic way it works is that the uh, sampled individuals are first given the census questionnaire, and then they are asked a series of questions about the sensitivity of the, of the questions in that questionnaire, and um, a series of questions about how they perceive confidentiality protection to apply to those data, how worried they are about particular characteristics. And in the last design, the questionnaire that they saw actually contained a citizenship question, so they were asked, they were asked about that as well. Um, in addition, the early research from that group confirms most of what you said, that it, it's extremely difficult for um, a randomly sampled household in the United States to relate to the way technical professionals in this area describe confidentiality protection, describe uh, privacy risk, and, uh, and even more difficult for them to relate to the quantifications of it that uh, we, we are using. So, uh, so the, the behavioral scientists are really working very hard at trying to understand what people actually understand about confidentiality protection and, uh, and then uh, get more information about the sensitivity of, of various attributes. That group is making a report to the National Advisory Committee in one of its upcoming meetings, and we can certainly schedule a, a similar report for, for CSAC. I think it, it really does, uh, everything you said is exactly on the mark and, uh, and was, was known to our, um, our good confidentiality uh, behavioral science research group, and so we should have them uh, report more of that research. Uh, from Deborah, who's on the phone. Um, uh, she writes, I very much appreciate John's presentation and the terrific video. Could he comment on differential privacy within the RDC network? Seems to me that the RDC may become more important as additional protection is put in place on publicly released data. Given the additional security and selection requirements to use an RDC, is there a commitment to minimally perturb the data in order to maximize its utility. My concern is that all possible analytical uses cannot be predetermined. As you might imagine, I get that question uh, relatively often. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to give a very nuanced answer to the question, and so I invite uh, um, follow-up if that's needed. So currently in the FSRDCs, when the project involves Census Bureau data, the researchers get minimally perturbed versions of those files. Sometimes they actually get the full underlying file. Sometimes they get, like in the case of the 2010 census, they get the 100% detail file to work with. And it's, it's PIC, uh, among other things. So, so then their studies produce statistical summaries that are intended for the open scientific community, and they go through a custom disclosure avoidance review that is actually exemplar in, in uh, the world in the sense that their full code base from the assets that they were allowed to access all the way through to the tables they wish to release is subject to and gets a review by a trained disclosure avoidance officer. And that officer applies traditional disclosure limitation. We are not changing that system, but we are changing what the 
traditional disclosure avoidance does, migrating it to formally private disclosure avoidance. But again, just like for the American Community Survey, we have not put those uh, practices in place. For certain RDC projects that were proposed to make major large-scale data releases, which is very unusual. We normally don't allow that, but there are some. They usually are associated with an internal project as well as a, an external RDC project. In those cases, we have already used formally private methods, just as we do for new products being developed inside the Census Bureau. There isn't a cure for the generally, general scientific hypothesis. It is possible to make public use products that support all the same hypotheses that a, that a traditionally prepared public use microsample would have prepared, including the, the, the ones we're doing from the 2020 census. They support more scientific hypotheses than the 2010 release package did because the full interactions are in the estimation set. So, so, so there's no one size fits all answer for the FSRDCs. There's no change in the process for applying. You couldn't use the 2010 CEF, so the way in which you're going to get access to the 2020 CEF still has to be worked out. But that's, I think that's a fair answer from my point of view. We haven't changed the way in which you access the American Community Survey, but we are extremely careful about the disclosure avoidance reviews for the outputs, and the researchers know that, and they know that at the proposal stage. They have to lay out what, what it is that the article is supposed to take out. Where we get the most pushback in the RDCs is in the revise and resubmit process for scientific journals. The editors and reviewers, since they can't touch the confidential data, rightly ask for the analyst to do things that challenge the robustness of their results. We don't want to release all of those side analyses. We want to provide a mechanism by which the journal's data editor him or herself can come in and certify that what the authors claimed is true. And we are working very hard on that in a reproducible science project that um, has the participation of some of the major journal data editors. So uh, it's, I said I was going to give a nuanced answer also, it's long, but I, I don't want to leave the impression that every use of the data now has to be in an FSRDC. More do. And we've been saying that since 2016, but that's no surprise to anyone. In most countries, you can't access the microdata that, uh, that many researchers can access from, from America. And I'm not saying that's going to stop either, but it's, this is not a, a, a fixed environment. It's a, it's a moving environment, and we have to adjust as the, as the risks and the, and the benefits change. There are enormous benefits to doing this research. I've done it myself for more than 20 years. Those are not going to be cut off by adopting formal privacy for the, as, the, as the main standard for disclosure avoidance. But it's going to take more work to get it implemented in all, the, in all parts of the Census Bureau. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that sounds totally fair to me. And, um, uh, you know, because it's, it's very understandable that whatever gets released in terms of research has to also go through disclosure avoidance. Um, uh, I, I loved um, the video for many things, and um, one was sort of the very last question, right? Which is like, how do you make that trade-off between answering every possible question and answering important questions? And um, so I wonder, you know, uh, if there's um, guidance or if, if how you all think about what are the important questions. You may not have the answer to that right now, but certainly policy questions are important, and then every possible researcher question may or may not be as important, or, and, then the, and, as, and as Jack said, a really important point, like business is suddenly going to have thousands of questions Tom, now that they have more Tom, Tommy, capacity. Tommy Wright, Tommy Wright, I'm oh, sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry. Hi. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to interrupt. It is now time for public comment. I believe I actually have five timepieces, and they all have five different times, so I'm going to go by my smartphone. <laughs> 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 we take public comment and... In writing, in person, and by phone. In person, comments are limited to two minutes. Anything over that may be submitted in writing for the record. If you are following virtually and would like to make a comment, please dial 1-888-946-7606, and the passcode is 3615-102, the number sign. I will request comments from the phone lines last to give you time to dial in. 
We have received three written public comments, which are now posted on the CSAC meeting page at census.gov. Written comments are received at census.scientific.advisory.committee at census.gov. The three written submissions, uh, I, rather than summarize them, I have surveyed the opening paragraphs of each, and it looks like they fall under two minutes. And if you would indulge, I will read them uh, according to the order in which they were received, the, the, the first opening paragraph. Public comment of Deborah Stein, Network Director of the Partnership of America's Children, and Deborah Weinstein, Executive Director of the Coalition on Human Needs to the Census Scientific Advisory Committee meeting September 2019. We are submitting these comments on behalf of the Partnership for America's Children and the Coalition on Human Needs. Both organizations are on the leadership team of the National Count All Kids Initiative, a national working group of child-serving organizations that is developing strategies and tools and resources to help ensure that all young children are counted. The second written received, uh, and, and there's much more. The second written uh, submission is from Fatima Kaja from the Economic, Demographic, and Statistical Research of Fairfax County, Virginia. Dear committee members, we at the Economic, Demographic, and Statistical Research of Fairfax County, Virginia, are writing to you with serious concerns and considerable confusion about the disclosure of ordinance measure differential privacy to be implemented with the 2020 census. We are calling for a transparency of the methodology that highlights the impact on redistricting process and any subsequent census data programs and products. Census Bureau's mission is to serve as the nation's leading provider of quality data about its people and economy. 2020 Census needs to provide accurate data that meet local governments and public services data needs. We urge a carefully mapped out adoption procedure uh, preceded by rigorous and prudent scientific evaluation from diverse local data users. The third written, and there's much more. The third written submission is from Cindy Shockley, data coordinator of the Department of Child and Family Studies, uh, University of South Florida. <clears throat> I use census data daily and rely on both sub-county level data as well as age groups of young children, specifically age zero to four. I understand that there are recommendations to not have all these data products available from the 2020 census, and I ask that you reconsider this. These data are vital to those of us who focus on programs and policies related to young children and their families. Without the availability of these data, we cannot be as strong an advocate for our most vulnerable populations. I ask that you please continue to provide data for both sub-county level and age groups of young children for as many areas pertaining to children and their families as you possibly can. And that's the entire uh, correspondence. Now, do we have anyone who would like to make comment in the room? If so, please proceed uh, to the table on the side of the room nearest the doors label public comment. And this is going to be limited to two minutes. Before making your comment, yes. The table or you the, stand it? You could, the table. If it, before making your comment, please state your name and affiliation clearly. Would you press the light? Thank you for this opportunity to speak here. My name is Li Yang. Actually, I present the testimony almost everywhere, every agency, because I think social issues are interrelated. But I think I need to repeat all those comments. And if you think about this, it's just so serious. And I'm sure Census Bureau is important 
because you do counting every person, every person's voice count. But I think the problem now is almost every agency is, is conspired together with law enforcement, with government attorneys, with private attorneys, almost everywhere they conspire together. And then now they put everybody, as long as they want to rob their rights, rob their properties, rob their families' assets, they would handcuff them, shackle them, send them to jail, or send them to hospital, or behavior science institute, almost everywhere. Now you say they have no voice because they are in the jail, they cannot do anything, then they cannot run election because they run all their resources, multi-million dollars. Even they have the best model families, and they have a very gifted children, they have a very high achiever record. But they doesn't count anything because this society is ruin their families, ruin our societies. And now I want to really mention about this because I myself is a PhD in economics. My husband is, is also a PhD in economics from Columbia University. My two children are graduate of MIT, but they are all labeled unfit, ill, and just about everything worse that you can mention about that. And I have to turn them around, but still my husband was murdered by this, what I call robberism. That's what I mean is, if you relate to this all together, is murder, abuse, official misconduct, government game, fraud, crime, injustice network operation. Now, Civil rights are practically totally ignored from local to federal, you know, even to global. Yeah, this especially important is now they use PPP, public-private partnership. They as propaganda almost everywhere from all the civil organizations to government agencies, whether that is the Department of Justice or Small Business Administration or HUD. And of course, you think all three Branches from local to federal to global, they doesn't mean anything because they, they go ignore all people's complaint with all the improper processing, so complaint, procedure, proceedings, record or, uh, record or re any kind of request. They ignore all those. So even you have a file that's the Supreme Court with the, all the constructive dis discharge, but still go nowhere because they take away all your rights and all your litigation and ignore with all kinds of excuses. And they don't even allow you to file the complaint. Even you file a complaint doesn't mean anything because they ignore them. Now I'm most I'm, considered I'm, I'm, I'm very so the I'm very, mass. I'm very sorry. I'm yeah, very, I'm, I'm, very I'm, much I'm, very, I'm very sorry. This is Tommy Wright. Uh, the two minutes have been uh, reached, actually exceeded. Uh, do you, if you have written comments, we would be happy to receive those, but the two minute, uh, has been, your, your allowance for two minutes has been exceeded. Okay. Please, um, I'm so very sorry. I have a lot of complaint I, issues. I, I understand, mass, but, the, but we have- incarcerations, and they take away all their resources and everything is there. And I, I would like to submit a comment Please again, do submit. And maybe with a lot of attachments, because every word is count and serious stories. I hope this Census Bureau takes serious account and serious information from there. We, we will receive your comments. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. Are there any public commenters on the phone? Well, maybe I should ask, are there any other commenters in the room? President, any public comments in the room? Present in the room? Any on the phone? In, None on the phone, okay. Well, thank you very much. We will continue with the presentation and, and discussion. Uh, Allison and maybe John was getting ready to chime in. Yeah, Allison. I think, yeah, I think I had a half formulated question there. If um, the video ended with um, the very good observation about determining um, what are important uh, uses and questions um, and wondered if, um, how the Census Bureau, if the Census Bureau currently has guidance on determining that. Uh, 
It's John About again. I think it's fair to say that this is new ground for everybody in the room, and it's certainly new ground for everybody in the Census Bureau. So um, we have made a very strong effort to identify first the known statutory uses of the data, and um, we ourselves, a, a, a large team, not just in the disclosure avoidance area, but throughout the Bureau, are attempting to assess the privacy loss budget necessary to meet uh, reasonable interpretations of those statutory requirements. Um, one of the things with which we have struggled and struggled with the American Community Survey is communicating the notion that when we published data at a very detailed geographic level, those are official publications, but they are intended to be used to build arbitrary geographic aggregates. They are not intended to stand alone. The block group level tabulations from the American Community Survey and the block level tabulations from historical censuses were never designed to stand alone as accurate data about that block or that block group. They are designed to provide pixels of various sizes. So a block is the smallest pixel. And in fact, that's the way it came into our tabulation products. What was the smallest geographic unit that a redistricting specialist could use to move people around to meet the requirement? It wasn't to design voting districts that had equal population and one block each. That's not the use case. The use case is voting districts for legislative bodies for a variety of different uh, municipal, you know, uh, governmental levels that uh, have to have either exactly or approximately equal population. So you need a pixel that can accommodate that. And that's what you'll have with the publication. So have an official population in that pixel and the ability to move them around. And that geographic definition uh, is uh, making that more accurate as those geographic areas get more populous is precisely the use case that we made sure the products had. Some of the other statutory use cases uh, are more difficult, and we are working on them. But um, another example is our own POP estimates need uh, sex by age pyramids, and so we are examining that kind of uh, summary to make sure that uh, the data are useful for that purpose too. So there's a lot of different interest groups. It's extraordinarily hard to balance those interests, and it's not something we have a lot of practice doing, so uh, we're gonna hope to get good at it really fast, but uh, as I said before, we seek input not just on the accuracy of the data products, but on the decision-making process and the balancing of interests that are inherent in setting a privacy loss budget. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's from Deborah. Since the environment is moving, will the application of these new methods be studied to see the implications of it in the R? The, she writes RRCs, but I think she meant the census um, RPCs. Thank you. Yeah. So it's a yeah. Do you understand the question? It's kind of vague. Sorry, John A. Bodigan. I don't understand how that question is different from the one I answered earlier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you don't either. No, I don't. Okay. Either, so <laughs> I think we're good. I think we're good. I, um, yes. Kathy wanted to say something. Yeah. Yes. Um, Sorry, I was so involved in the um, explanation of differential privacy last time I forgot my question, but I remembered it. Um, the, just thinking about the timing, this has been brought up about the release of the citizenship structure is March 31st, 2020, in the heat of trying to encourage people to answer the census. So has there been thoughts about communications on that? Not that. Um, I understand that it's siloed, but also what would be picked up by the news or social media or other things that could, um, you know, just encourage misinformation. So uh, we're not going to do anything that disrupts the operations of the 2020 census. That would be counterproductive. Uh, in explaining where those deadlines come from, they, they come from the necessity to formalize what we're going to actually do. And so they are hard internal deadlines, but uh, the communication plan 
will be developed in a manner that uh, ensures that the uh, 2020 census can be conducted with minimal disruption. And Joe. Uh, thank you very much, John, for the presentation and also the video I thought was superb. Um, and we had a sneak preview thanks to our colleague. Uh, I thought that was excellent. Um, in terms of the uh, complexity of this issue, in terms of the, uh, the census looking at some of the citizenship related issues, it's something we looked at closely at Homeland Security. We were, that's what we did, you know, the, C, the CBP, the uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services, and the Homeland Security uh, investigations. We had those, those three groups. So, uh, citizenship at Homeland was divided into those three pieces by the Homeland Security Act that was passed uh, in the wake of 9-11, dealing with those issues. So citizenship is what was sort of what we did at Homeland Security, discreetly, though not in this broad uh, census format that we're thinking about. And I think it was important for us not to uh, be involved in, in some larger equation, um, just looking at this, this from a quantification point of view, in other words, how I think this is something maybe um, maybe Krishna made this point about quantification. I think it's important that it be we move away from uh, from the the block level concerns and look at it from uh, a, a more a larger geographic space. Perhaps uh, obviously from my point of view at the state level, what 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 is uh, what is this what does this issue uh, of citizenship look like uh, in America in, in 2020? Uh, so I, I, I want to make sure that I, I'm articulating what I think is a micro, the micro uses we had at Homeland were very important to us to deal with individual situations of U.S. entry, for example, or uh, who was going to be getting a visa at a consular situation in another country around the world, um, trusted traveler programs, those of you in this room, many of you have used those programs. Uh, uh, the, uh, those, those programs look at a lot of data that's highly sensitive, and, we, and I think at Homeland we did a pretty good job of keeping it extremely close, but to get these um, privileges, people had to submit information to Homeland Security to obtain those privileges, some of which was their citizenship obviously was a relevant factor in us evaluating those circumstances. But I do think I, as I sit where I sit currently, my view of this is that um, it seems as though that the, um, the, 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 the census uh, has to be protected from these concerns about, you know, this, that these, this information will be used somehow to um, push someone aside who's currently in the United States. So I, I strongly endorse um, making sure that we protect this just like we did at Homeland, uh, the personally identifiable information that we we had the sensitive Homeland Security information, we had uh, the national security information, we had about any number of different issues. Um, I think, anyway, I hope, hope that the public had confidence in us at Homeland that we were maintaining those in a discreet way. So I, I, I think how the data is uh, generated and shared is important, and I think that's something I see, I, I appreciate that you've been doing and the whole uh, department has been doing, so I appreciate the leadership that's been given this issue. And also I look forward to hearing from, I don't know what we'll, we can hear from the internal working group when it's meeting and discussing some of these issues, but I, I do value the participation in this. I, as I step back from it, um, I don't know, uh, I'm no longer in government, but I wonder uh, about the utility of this for uh, on a macro level, um, what that would look like. And I don't know what the requested uses have been. In other words, the people saying, we want this data uh, and, and for uh, utility, what utility does this serve? In other words, what, is, what are some of the requested uses, John, that this information would, would be for? In other words, is there uh, utility for the state of Georgia, for example, to know and the, as opposed to the anecdotal numbers that we, we've heard, and I mentioned this yesterday, uh, that there are 11 million um, uh, residual people without documents, whatever the, whatever the new nomenclature is, 
that's not undocumented or illegal, there's a new, new terminology that I think has been utilized. It's just the, um, the, 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 the awareness of this might be a way to help state legislatures appreciate that they need to uh, provide more money, for example, for bilingual education or more uh, set-asides for um, assimilation of populations that may be in their state that they don't fully appreciate that are there, but I'm just making some of this up right now. So I'll end my comments because I appreciate uh, the tolerance of uh, Tommy and Allison for these lengthy comments, but I struggle with this because I have this previous background. It's important for us to know these things in these discrete ways, but in terms of the broader uh, utility of this information, I'm curious about what requested uses people might have articulated for this, because the, the, the last thing we need, need to have happen is someone not fill out their census form. This is just my, my our articulated concern because of their concern that this information somehow might be used against them individually. And I don't think that's the, that's the contemplation of how this information would be used, but I'm not certain because I don't know uh, how it would be used. But I, I, I set out a couple of examples which are how do we appropriate money? Uh, certainly a portion will not be affected by this because no matter whether someone's a citizen or a non-citizen, congressional seats are allocated based on how many people are in a certain geographic area. Sorry, sorry that may be more of a comment than it is a question, but I, I wanted to share those thoughts with you. And, I, and so there may be a, see if you can dig a question out of that, John. <laughs> I don't think it will come as, this is John Abbott again, I don't think it will come as much of a surprise to you, Joe, that I take questions on this subject uh, with uh, extreme sensitivity. So what I would like to say is that the slides that I presented on the uses of the 2020 census for apportionment, for redistricting, and to produce a CBAP product are what we understand the, and what will be the, the, our procedure. So. I also wanted to clarify that apportionment is based on the resident population, and the resident population is a well-defined uh, entity that includes both citizens and non-citizens. Um, the production of the block-level CBAP data is a secretarial instruction, and so we are attempting to gather information about the, uh, the use case that it's supposed to, to meet, and um, will be as transparent as we can be about how that product was produced for those use cases. And like you said, it's the Roach Motel, right? Comes in, doesn't go out. So um, that's always important, I think, to emphasize. Yes, that's the question wasn't uh, to, to repeat that. Let me repeat it because it's, this is John About again. It's always important to note that uh, we are ingesting identifiable data, but we are making what I think can be reasonably characterized as an extremely strong effort to make sure that the publications can only be used for statistical purposes and that they don't endanger uh, uh, any of the respondents to the 2020 census uh, we want everyone to respond to the 2020 census, and we are doing our best to communicate all the efforts we're taking to protect the confidentiality of those data and any other data we use in combination with the 2020 census. And I appreciate that's the absolute mantra that this has to be treated as a, I, I don't know if, how I deal with the Roach Motel <laughs> metaphor, but I do think it's important this information goes in and it's critical that it be treated in a way that encourages people to engage in whatever, whatever their citizenship status might be. It's so critical that they appreciate this is a unique American phenomenon, and I'm preaching to the choir because those of you that have lived here your entire careers uh, live this, but I, 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 I appreciate the, this responsibility having done some of this pre, in a previous lifetime with a, something called the Census Monitoring Board, and uh, thank you. Did you have something else, Juan Pablo? Yeah. Yes. This is Juan Pablo Raquel. I just have a very quick couple of suggestions. 
And I guess first a, a little bit of uh, praise for, for John's work and, and the Census Bureau's work on differential privacy. In the research world, we, there's a, we oftentimes talk about how well, you know, research papers come out about a topic and uh, it takes 10 years, 15 years for any kind of implementation to happen. And I think where we're seeing here is a lot of leading research being implemented right away. So kudos on that. Uh, related to that, um, just suggestions on a couple of communities that keep coming to my mind every time I, I listen to John's presentations. Um, and one of them is a formal methods community in computer science. I think that there's been a little bit of research on differential privacy in the formal methods community, but I think it's, I think it will be a good match. There will be people in the formal methods community who will be interested in this kind of problem. Uh, so it might be interesting to try to engage or maybe encourage them to apply for NSF funding uh, to do some research uh, on the topic. Um, and the other one is people working with health records. That's uh, an area where there's, there's a lot of that uh, being produced. Uh, I think what I have seen for folks who do that kind of research is not nearly as sophisticated as what you're doing here. Uh, and in many ways that data for a lot of people might be more sensitive than census data. So I think that might be another interesting uh, connection where maybe more minds, more uh, thinking about this problem could, uh, could lead to, to good outcomes. Great. Uh, I think that's it, huh? Um, so, um, folks who have uh, comments or suggestions, um, Krishna is going to be, uh, um, accum you know, accumulating them. Um, and uh, so, please be sure to um, plan to get with him on that. Uh, and but we'll do that a little bit later today. Um, so I think we got a break, huh? Yeah. On time? Are we on time? <gasps> we get two extra minutes of break. No. <laughs> no just oh. Oh, I thought we were early. Okay, so we're coming back at 11:45.
I have not. Okay.
Hello, as soon as the chair comes and takes her chair. Yes, I want to. I want to thank her. Tommy Wright. I hope most of the committee is finding its way back. All right, we got to get started. Seats. Running out of time. Come on, gang. Yes. <laughs> as, as Barbara would say. Yes, yes, she would. I was actually thinking about that this morning. <laughs> Tommy Wright, the, the presenters are, are here, and uh, Bill Samples and Bill Davey, who will present on the dissemination plans for the 2017 economic census. And there is a discussant, Andrew Samwick. Yes. All right, let's see if we get these slides to... So good morning. Um, thank you for having us here today. My name is Bill Samples. I am the Economic Census Assistant Survey Director. Uh, next to me is Bill Davey, who is the Economic Census Methodology Director, and we'll be splitting up the presentation today. Um, we're going to be presenting an update on the 2017 Economic Census, in particular an update regarding our data dissemination for the 2017 Economic Census. Uh, when I was last here in December of 2018, I provided an update on our data collection process, um, which we were in the middle of at that time. That process closed out in March of 2019, and we've now moved into data review and editing, um, and we'll release our first set of data from the 2017 Economic Census next Thursday on September 19th. So some brief background information, um, just to get everybody on the same page. So the Economic Census is authorized under Title 13 of the United States Code, Section 131. The data is collected every five years, years ending in two and seven. Um, all the content on the questionnaires is uh, developed in cooperation with business and government. The economic census is the most comprehensive measurement of the U.S. economy. Uh, we provide statistics at the national, state, and local levels, and I'll go through some of that information later. Um, and it provides information on industry revenues and other measures of uh, American performance, American business performance that are consistent comparable and comprehensive across all different industries and geographic areas. We've got a wide range of data users. Uh, some of the big ones are listed here. Uh, first one, Bureau of Economic uh, Analysis. They use the data for determining gross domestic product, uh, personal consumption expenditures, and the national income and product accounts. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services use economic census data uh, as input into their geographic health spending by state. The Federal Reserve um, will use economic census data as benchmark for their industrial production and industrial capacity numbers. Bureau of Labor uses economic census data as input into their producer price index. And then obviously there's a whole wide range of other users, uh, including the American public, federal agencies, trade associations, et cetera, that use the data for making personal decisions, business decisions, or policy. In terms of the universe for the economic census, um, there's currently 32.1 million business establishments in the United States. Um, the key word being establishments, the economic census is an establishment-based survey. Um, of those 32.1 million, only 7.8 million have employees. That there is the universe for the economic census because we only cover employer establishments. Of the 7.8 million establishments that have employees, we only mail out 4 million. The rest are handled through administrative data records. So to, to kind of wrap up data collection, which I spoke on in December, I've got a couple graphs that I want to just share. These are uh, response rate graphs. Um, in, in overall response on the economic census, we were around 75%. Um, this first graph is the response rate by state on the mailed location. So where did we actually mail the letters for the respondents to report? Um, you can imagine that some large companies would receive all their establishments at their headquarters location to report. Um, so you can see the response by state. 
the lowest response by state would have been seen in Connecticut. Um, and you can look at the graph and, and the, the color coding. If it's closer to red, it's a lower response. Closer to the deep blue is a higher response. And so you can quickly glance across the map and see where we got our low response and where we got our high response by state. Again, lowest was Connecticut, um, U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. And the highest were uh, Iowa, Arkansas, and then the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. This next map shows our response rate by physical location, so the actual physical location of where the establishments exist. We may not have mailed the, the questionnaire to the establishment, it might have gone to the headquarters, but this response rate map shows you by their actual physical location what the response rates were by state. Again, the same color coding. Uh, anything that is closer to the deep red is a lower response by state, and anything to the deep blue is a higher response. Our lowest were seen in D.C., in New York, and Rhode Island, and our highest were again in Iowa and Wisconsin. So it gives you a pretty good graphical representation of where we saw our responses. So leading up to data dissemination, after we actually capture the data, obviously we take a significant amount of time to edit and review it, uh, especially when you're talking about four million cases that were mailed out and are reporting back to us. Um, when the data comes in, it runs through the business register first, and the business register handles information that updates things such as the organizational structure, changes in ownership, new establishment ads, so new locations that have been added to a company, uh, information rela related to geography, and so forth. So we make sure that we have the company structure correct on the business register. Um, that's not only important for the economic census, but it's also important for all the other annual surveys and indicators that rely on census data for benchmarking. Uh, the specific trade area subject matter edits, so on the, what we call the back end when we actually receive the data in the trade areas, we then deal with looking at the data and performing checks for completeness and consistency. We compare to industry averages. We look at historic information. Uh, we validate logical scenarios such as does the revenue and payroll make sense? Are they not, they're not reporting payroll at a much larger rate than they are revenue. Um, and performing imputations of the data to ensure that we have a complete record. So are there missing items that then we have to impute for? Um, both of these types of edits on the business register as well as in the trade areas uh, will generate referrals for which we'll have clerical staff or analysts then review the case and make any updates and changes as necessary based upon what the referral was. Um, in general, our referral rates are somewhere between the neighborhood of 17 to 20% between the business register and the trade areas. So again, if you look at the numbers of four million cases that get mailed out, that's a quite a number of referrals that get worked during this process. And again, with the referrals, some referrals take absolutely no time at all to fix. It might take a minute, and then some referrals may take hours, depending on the amount of research that might be needed to update the record. So in continuing with data editing review, um, we'll also look at the largest companies to ensure the microdata of the most complex companies is reviewed and, and coordinated across all the trade areas. So if you have a large company that's in multiple trade areas, we'll make sure that the company holistically looks and, and makes sense across all those trade areas. Um, for the most part, these companies receive the most review. Obviously, they're probably the bigger bang for the buck on the data, so we'll spend a lot of time looking at the large companies. Uh, we'll also review the largest influer, influencers, and what we mean by that, the cases that influence the data the most. Uh, they have the most revenue or the most payroll, um, so we'll be sure to make sure those cases are correct. Um, and then we utilize uh, various programs in our editing, including something that's, that we consider a mass correction. If there's something systematically going wrong with the way a company reported or a group of businesses are reporting in an industry, we'll make some mass corrections so we can correct records quickly rather than doing them one by one. So once the micro review is complete, we'll move into the stage of macro review, which is where we are now. Um, it's conducted when there's a full set of tabulated data ready for review, so that includes having all of our cases that have reported back to us, having all of our non-mails and their administrative data that's associated with them, as well as delinquent cases that we then have to impute for. Um, at that point, we'll take all those records and aggregate them up to a macro level so we can start beginning a review of US level data, state level data, or industry level data. And to do that, we do that in order to verify that summary data is ready to be released. Um, this includes summary data for the entire universe, like I mentioned, 
uh, and we'll start to review problem identification of, of specific cells, cells that don't make sense at an aggregate. So if we're looking at comparisons of 2017 data and 2012 data, and we're seeing an industry that has a, a trend up of 150%, that may not make a whole lot of sense. So we'll then start drilling into the specifics of that industry to figure out what's going on there, and if there's a certain record or set of records that still need to be corrected. We'll look for large differences, as I mentioned, from, from 2012 to 2017, as well with our annual programs. We'll look at imputation levels. Do we have certain industries or states that have high imputation levels? And we'll try and figure out how we can get those levels down by, by uh, re reviewing the reported data and making sure that maybe there weren't any type of data slides or other issues that f uh, caused the record to be imputed instead. We'll look at historic levels, and then we obviously document all of our findings. Um, the last bullet point talks about reconciliation. We'll reconcile the data on, this, on the census in aggregate form with our annual surveys, um, our quarterly and monthly programs to make sure that the data across all the programs makes sense. And then we'll also rely on outdoor data, outside source data um, from other agencies or trade associations and outside experts to make sure the data is making sense before we release. So as I mentioned, we, we are releasing our first data product from the 2017 Economic Census next week on September 19th. This is the first look report. Um, it's preliminary data at the U.S. level by industry. Um, obviously, for the data that we disseminate, the demand is for detailed data. That data will be coming out over the next year or two um, with our geographic area series. Um, needs of the primary federal agencies and their requirements uh, have the most weight. So we do a lot of work and have a lot of discussions with BEA, BLS, FRB, and CMS about what their needs are. Um, we'll be utilizing the new enterprise tool for disseminating data, SEDSI. Um, data releases are being standardized also across all of our, our releases into what we're considering the economy-wide statistics data. Um, that way the data by industry are consistent in the table structure and they're comparable when you look across the various industries. In past census years, when we release data, we would release retail, we would release wholesale or construction and, and the data was not released always in the same format um, or at the same time. And so now we're doing releases that are economy wide. And as I mentioned, data releases start in September this month and they'll be completed by December 2021. So this is just a chart that shows you the different data product releases that we have. Um, as I mentioned, the first look report, which is general statistics at the two through six digit NAICS level or industry level, uh, will be released next week. Following that, we have the geographic area series, which released general statistics data. So basically revenue, payroll, employment, um, and a few other variables uh, at the US state, metro, county, and place level, again, for the two through six digit NAICS industries. Um, those will start to be released in January of 2020 on a flow basis through November 2020. And so we'll be releasing different states at different periods throughout that time. Following our geographic area series, we release our North American product classification system tables. So these are the goods and services produced by industry. That'll be released in November of 2020. And then we have all of our final releases that are released from November 2020 all the way through December 2021. The big point to take away from this slide is that throughout the set of releases from the first look all the way to the final releases, there's incremental improvement in the data quality. Obviously, next week our release is preliminary, and as we start to release the geographic area series, the data becomes final. Um, and so you get better data the further we go along and more specific data as we go along. So this slide is showing you how all the data relates throughout all the releases. So that very first top uh, bar that runs across, the first look report is US level data. Again, it's preliminary data. And it's showing you number of establishments, total employment, total payroll, and the revenue for a particular industry for this one tire manufacturing. Again, this is, this is data from 2012. Once the first look report is, is released, we then start releasing the geographic area series. These are the next three boxes underneath. And you'll see that for each state, we now produce the data, the number of establishments, total employment, payroll, and revenue. So across the 50 states in DC, if you aggregate those, those would then give you that US level total that is shown at the first look report. 
from there, we release the products data or the goods and services data. That's that bottom bar that runs, runs across. That's taking that total revenue that was originally reported in the first look and then finalized through the gas data and breaks out that revenue into the different goods and services that are produced. So you can see the red line that's connecting the data from the, the top revenue shipments of, of 20 billion down to the breakout of that revenue of tire manufacturing into passenger car tires, truck tires, tractor tires, et cetera. So you can see how the data connects throughout all of our releases. This is just a quick link for you to show you the release schedule page that you can, you can go to on your own. Again, it's basically the information I've just provided. And then we want to talk to you today a little bit about uh, our data dissemination risks. Um, the, the first one and the, the big one that we're going to talk to today, that Bill's going to talk to today, is the impact on the data related to disclosure methodology and the, and the requirements that we have in releasing the data. Um, the second risk is budgetary impacts. Um, we're always in a state of tight budgets working on the economic census, um, and there's risk to future data products being released, including our geographic area series, our product tables, and our final data release tables. Um, all of those releases are planned for, but we also need the budget funds in order to spend the time to review and release. All right, so I think Bill's going to jump in now and start talking about the data dissemination issues. Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, as he mentioned earlier, uh, we use uh, administrative records data from other agencies in the economic census for various reasons, whether it's for uh, editing, imputation, or uh, actually direct substitution in lieu of a response. So the source, one of our primary sources of the administrative data is the IRS. So specifically, I'm going to talk a bit about what the IRS uh, has done in terms of their confidentiality requirements. So back in uh, September of 2016, the IRS basically made a revision to their confidentiality requirements for agencies that receive and use tax return information in their statistical reports. Um, and the primary change was that they've added additional thresholds um, regarding the number of tax returns that must be included in a cell for the estimate to be released. Okay, so the guidance indicates that agencies must adhere to the IRS guidelines or an equivalent alternative that has been approved by the IRS. So up until this point, until the IRS released these revisions, the Census Bureau and the IRS had an agreement in place that basically the, the existing Census Bureau disclosure methods were in fact uh, treated as an equivalent alternative. <clears throat> so by that, we were able to use cell suppression or multiplicative noise infusion, um, which are two of our, our disclosure methods that we use uh, on the economic census. Uh, and one caveat I should put out, point out with that is we were also able to produce and, and publish counts of establishments and counts of firms. So that is something that is changing um, with the, the change in the IRS confidentiality requirements. And I'll show you a, a bit of that in a minute here. Um, so basically, since the IRS released these in September, the Census Bureau and IRS have been working over the past couple of years to come up with an agreement where we, we certified basically um, the two disclosure methods I mentioned, as well as some formerly private method that I'm sure you heard about from John earlier, that these are acceptable equivalent alternatives to the IRS requirements that show up in, in their, uh, their publication. So this agreement was done in August of 19, and it's effectively the same as the prior agreement that we had, except for this caveat on the counts, which I'll go into here in a minute. Okay, so what does this mean for the economic census? So basically, the IRS's stipulation was that we can no longer publish counts of establishments that are less than three. Okay, so for the economic census, uh, typically we did not treat counts of establishment or counts of firms as sensitive. So we could publish all counts, counts of one, counts of two, et cetera. 
Um, it's the magnitude data that we've always treated as sensitive. So by magnitude data, I mean receipts, payroll, employment. Those values we uh, would suppress based on something called the P percent rule under cell suppression. So now with this additional caveat, that means there's going to be additional cells, counts of establishments that we're no longer going to be able to provide that we're going to have to suppress. Okay, so this, this next slide attempts to just show at a very high level the approximate number of rows, and, and in this case, it's really only going to be counts that are suppressed. So what this table basically shows the 18 sectors covered by the economic census. Uh, the next row, which is the second row on the table, that gives you the, the number of rows where the establishment count is less than three uh, for that sector. The third row is the total number of rows, and then the fourth row is, or fourth column, I'm sorry, is the um, percentage, which is just uh, column two divided by column three. So a couple of points here. For the sectors where there's a few, very few number of rows less than three, we only publish that data to the state level. So you're not gonna expect a lot of cells that show up where you have fewer than three establishments contributing. Um, for the other rows, as Bill mentioned, that data is published down to the economic place level. Um, so you can see that the, for those rows, because of the detail we're actually providing, you're suppressing quite a number of counts from these tables. I'd also point out, keep in mind, we are already suppressing the magnitude data for these tables. So the receipts, the payroll, and employment would already be suppressed ba based on our existing suppression rules. Um, so this table tries to look at what would happen to zip code data. So for the zip codes, the only thing we publish from the economic census are actually counts of establishments by receipt size classes. We don't publish any other magnitude data at the zip code level. So this table shows the percentage of rows that we suppressed by, by increasing NAICS detail. You can see that in the second column there. It goes from two digit, three digit, four digit NAICS within, for example, the first row, sector 44, which is retail trade. And uh, you can see these percentages range from about 37%, which is uh, sector 62, that's healthcare at the two-digit NAICS level, that's the smallest, the whole way up to, uh, I think it's 82% at the four-digit NAICS level for sector 71, which is arts and entertainment. So quite a bit of suppression just resulting from this additional requirement in terms of uh, protecting the confidential uh, uh, administrative records data from the IRS. Um, so we have a couple of questions for the committee that uh, I think maybe our discussant will, will, will address or talk about, and then I think we'll open it up. But uh, looking ahead to the 2022 economic census, are there emerging trends that may need to be researched and data collected on? Since the census collects data in many, many areas, um, we're looking for feedback on, on content on the questionnaire. And then the second one has to do with the uh, issues and changes because of disclosure. Uh, what are the concerns about the impact on data and availability of data with changes to disclosure methodologies? And how should we inform data users about these changes and the effects on the data products? Okay, thanks to Bill Squared for their presentation. And uh, I guess more generally to the Economic Directorate and others that are involved in the economic census for a lot of good work. Um, you know, we don't talk about the economic census all that much at our meetings compared to some of the other uh, data products and areas at the census. So I found this infographic on the Census Bureau uh, web page about the uses of the economic census, and I thought I would put that up so we, we have a little bit more understanding of it. It has five types of information 
that's offered by the economic census along with possible uses. And you'll notice that the two on the right, the accurate benchmarks for economic indicators and the consistent comparable comprehensive measures, those might be disproportionately relevant to academic users, not exclusively. Uh, the three on the left, the characteristics of the U.S. businesses, uh, the information on business location and size, and the data to understand business competitive might have broader use in, uh, in non-academic purposes. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, there are three products at the census that are actually called a census. There's the decennial, the economic census, and the census of governments, and I'll, I'll return to that. So why do we need uh, an economic census? Uh, the main reason, I think, is to provide data at a detailed geographic and industry level, which the smaller surveys can't do. So for example, county business patterns is an annual data set. It has data at the county level. It includes six-digit uh, industry establishment size distribution, uh, employment and payroll, but it doesn't have the value of shipments. And finer geography, like zip code, will lose the employment and the payroll data. So you can sort of see the trade-off of uh, geographic versus, you know, sort of economic specificity there. There's another example, the annual survey of manufacturers allows national data with sub-industry detail, but at the state level, it's just at the sector level. And so every now and then, every five years in this case, um, uh, you, you have to go and get good industry detail and you have to get good uh, geographic detail. Uh, the other purposes are to obtain the comprehensive data on total activity so that you can benchmark the smaller and more frequent surveys. And thirdly, uh, to update the, the Census Bureau's master list of, uh, of businesses. Okay, so uh, uh, the presentation talked about um, the, the schedule for releases. Uh, there are some key changes relative to what we saw in 2012 that I thought I would highlight. As I may be known uh, at the census as the most clunky user of the American Fact Finder system, <laughs> I am uh, extremely glad to see the new uh, platform at data.census.gov. That's going to make my life a whole lot easier, so thank you for that. Uh, another change is that they're using the 2017 North American Product Classification System. Uh, for detailed data on product lines. And as they showed, product line is distinct uh, from industry classifications. So for example, just sort of poking around in the 2012 economic census, one product code was meals and beverages prepared and served or dispensed for immediate consumption, something you might get when I'm done with my, pre my presentation. And you find that product across a range of industries, obviously some disproportionately, but you'll also find it in healthcare and social assistance. You'll also find it in arts, entertainment, and recreation, where it comprises a, a small, like in the latter one, 6% uh, of sales. But most NAICs uh, do tend to have a primary uh, 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 product code. And as you saw, we're scheduled to get these cross tabulations of product by industry and vice versa in November 2020. So something interesting to happen in that month. And then uh, the third one, and this is where uh, we heard a lot of the, uh, the presentation, is that we have to accommodate new privacy rules, particularly the suppression of the establishment count, when it's less than three. And I, I sort of think that, you know, with all of the discussion about um, sort, of, sort of what now needs to be suppressed, certainly at the, at the level of uh, the establishment count, you sort of have to wonder what you have left in, in what, you're, what you're presenting. I appreciate, and we heard uh, Nick say yesterday, that uh, there had been uh, a budget cut of, if I'm not misquoting, 15 to 20 percent. Uh, we heard in the presentation today that current budgetary risks uh, place the release of all of the contemplated products uh, uh, in, in some degree of jeopardy. And Obviously, that's you know unfortunate to those of us uh, who who seek to use this data. I, I can say that you know the paper that I've published that I'm most proud of relied heavily for the empirical work uh, on on the 1992 economic uh, census 
So I, I think you sort of have to just open up the conversation about uh, for a given budget, uh, what dimension needs to change and you know, just sort of parenthetically, if this became a once every 10 year census, but you could sort of not have to rely on the IRS and it's seemingly overly restrictive uh, condition here. Uh, so you could go out and survey the other half of the establishments, um, then that, I guess that's on the table. And so I'll, you know, I'm not trying to make that decision obviously for anyone, but that would seem to be the most natural given, uh, you know, given sort of the nature of, uh, of the budgetary environment. So, you know, my, my opinion shouldn't be uh, definitive there, but that was the first one that, that sort of left to mind. Uh, a presentation left us with a few uh, questions for the committee. Uh, the first one was looking ahead to the 2022 economic census, and I admire your optimism. Are there emerging trends that may need to be researched and data collected on? And I, I've put three out for uh, the general discussion. Uh, the first is uh, the gig economy as uh, a possibly growing share of economic activity. Uh, I, I think this, you know, incorporates an idea about big data and administrative data from, from other sources. I'll show you uh, a, a chart about what I mean. Uh, the second, and this was mentioned in the presentation, is there any way to integrate data on non-employer businesses more generally? And the third, um, you know, I, I'm not one of the users in the non-academic community, and I think this is probably, you know, me speaking a little bit out of turn. Um, but as I think about what might be relevant to someone uh, wondering about a business investment decision, or a local government sort of worried about its economic future of its jurisdiction, I think as much about occupations uh, as I do about industries. Industries might be the answer to the question, uh, so what do they make here, right? And particularly industries combined with product classifications. Um, but the question about occupations is, um, so what can people do here? And imagine you're in an environment where an entity in your jurisdiction that made something is going to relocate somewhere else. So you're no longer necessarily going to make that thing. Well, the process of resuming economic growth in light of that shock depends very much on how you can employ people and sort of the census of what you need to employ is based on the sorts of skills people have. So when I use the word occupation there, I'm using it basically to, to, to sort of proxy for that. And there's, there's just a question about whether this might be the right place to get that sort of data. And I have a little bit more to say about that. So I won't go through the, the details about this, but um, you know, so I said the gig economy. So the, you know, there are two, there are two sorts of companies that sort of are preeminent in, in the gig or the, the sharing economy. One's Uber, one's Airbnb. Okay, so you just ask yourself, where in the economic census would uh, Uber show up? And so this NAICS is for taxi services. Uh, there is some ambiguity. I mean, most of the time when you're, you're seeing people who drive for Uber ask what industry am I in, it's because they need to get a state license and they have to fill in something on the form. So this is this is the guidance. Uber was two years old at this point. If you compare that top line to 2007, there was maybe a 5% increase in establishments. And so this is exactly the sort of question about, are we going to be able to capture, you know, the, ac the economic activity of taxis where it really is a bunch of independent contractors? It's not even clear to me that any of that would necessarily show up in the economic census. You'll get Uber's headquarters as about half of the people currently associated in an economic context uh, with Uber. So I'm not, I'm not saying anything is wrong. I'm saying if you ask for an emerging trend, that's the one that, uh, that sort of leapt to mind first. Uh, this is reproduced from the presentation. And basically that, that statement about Uber is just a question about can you provide uh, for public use 
in addition to whatever role it might be playing in the benchmarking process, uh, something that integrates uh, the non-employer statistics, which this group heard about twice last year, um, into uh, what you collect from the economic census. And I note that uh, it was encouraging to find uh, an example of a merge of the NES, the non-employer statistics, with the county business patterns. And so I'm just wondering, just a question, what have you learned from the availability of that data that might tell you, or tell me, um, whether that would be interesting on a larger scale? And so that's the that's sort of the direct question to it. And the thinking about occupations, um, there are lots of places where uh, uh, the federal government collects, and, and, and uh, the heavy lifting is done, obviously, at the census, information about occupation and industry with some geographic detail on it. Uh, the American Community Survey does that, the Current Population Survey does that, and the SIP does that. So you could say, well, if you were a user and you wanted to know that, you'd have that information. It would be reported by the individual respondent in those cases. Okay, so sometimes uh, in uh, you know, the measurement of economic activity, you have both a, a way of getting the information from the household and a way of getting the information from the, uh, the employer or the establishment. Uh, the monthly uh, employment report is a very good example. It often creates a bit of confusion that there's a household survey and there's an establishment survey. Uh, so the question and the motivation I described earlier uh, is whether you would ever think that it would be worth getting information directly from the establishment about something on the skill mix proxied here by occupation uh, of, uh, of the workforce that's there. And so that's an open question. I don't even know that the answer is yes. To the extent the answer is yes, you'd have to ask what is the incremental value of doing that uh, above and beyond what's available in the, um, in the uh, household surveys that I described. I do note that the, the BLS has something called the Occupational Employment Statistics. I don't know if that's a survey that's actually done by the Census Bureau on, on their behalf. I have found that uh, survey very challenging to work with and I think there's actually some disclaimers on the website saying not really reliable for comparisons over time. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a potential user who would be very interested in that. And then my uh, final slide, and I alluded to some of this earlier, I mean, just for the purposes of describing what is lost, I think percentage of rows suppressed is probably a portion of what's relevant, but something about uh, the percentage of revenue or shipments that is, you know, how, how the weighting that information by how much economic activity is actually in those establishments would be uh, helpful. And I think for the dissemination question, you really have to let the focus group and literature review uh, be your guide. You have better information on who's using your data and how than I do, and so that that would, that would be where I would, uh, I would start. I guess I, I would say that, um, you know, if you're gonna be subject to these IRS rules because you sort of rely on their administrative data and so they call the tune and the budgetary environment is not such that you can contemplate in any way going out and getting all of it, more of it yourselves, then maybe there's a different role for the Census Bureau to play. I mean, I think you're going to learn when you abide by these procedures for the 2017, uh, which parts of the user community are in need of assistance. Well, you are a data production and dissemination organization, but you could also be a consultant. And so without collecting and disseminating the data yourself, you should sort of get in the business of seeing what sort of needs people have, right? If it were related to, we heard yesterday, disaster recovery or the like, you are data experts in addition to be data, in addition to data collectors and disseminators, and I suspect you'll discover you have some, some value to the user community there. So let me pause there and uh, say thank you again to uh, the team for the good work that they're doing. Thank you, Andrew. Um, is, was there anything you all wanted to respond about first, or shall we open it up?
to other questions. No, open up. Uh, I see Joe has his tent up, but I think that's, yeah, <laughs> left over. Um, okay, cool. Juan Pablo? This is Juan Pablo Rocad uh, from the University of Iowa. So I heard here the Hawkeye State ranked number one. So that's good to hear. Um, so I thought of, I, I also had the gig economy, just like uh, Andrew had to answer your question. Uh, I thought of another area that I, maybe you're capturing already, I don't know, and that's uh, remote work. So people, especially in the knowledge economy, who where the establishment might be in one place, but they're actually physically located elsewhere. Sometimes there might even be U.S. citizens who work for a U.S. company who might live abroad and, and do work remotely. And th I think that's going to increase, and it might be interesting to think about how to capture that information if it's not already being captured. Um, and then I have one idea that given budget constraints, probably not going to happen, uh, but it's to um, perhaps get back to s the establishments that responded and perhaps even some of those that didn't respond and when you release the data for 20, from 2017, get back to them and say, here's something related to your sector or your geography. So in a way, giving them value for the effort that they put in to, uh, to respond, or perhaps you know, with a little encouragement since 2022 is just around the corner, hopefully, they'll remember the, the value. Again, maybe not gonna happen because of budget constraints, but. I guess we can put that one in the would be nice column. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, anyone else? No. That's fine because we uh, have to go over our recommendations. So uh, we can always end the discussion early if folks don't have additional questions or comments. Are we good? Yeah? You didn't need to respond to what Juan Pablo suggested? No. No. Just one quick response on the comment about the remote workers. So right now, the way that we probably are capturing it, and again, it's probably a, a unknown unknown, is they are probably being captured in the location that they report back to, and not at their actual individual address. So if they're an employee of a company, and they report back to a regional office, that employment value probably shows up in that regional office. Okay, so I think, uh, is it okay we can break, grab our lunch and come back and get going? Do we need to do anything else? Tommy Wright, one little editorial. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill and Bill and Andrew. And I forgot to also say this for John and Tori. Early. I know it's on their minds that they weren't thanked, but thank you very much for those present presentations. Uh, this ends the session, and we're going to grab lunches, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So we're 15 minutes early, and um, uh, Andrew rightly pointed out to me we don't have a lot of time to discuss the recommendations. So um, I recommend, you know, everybody get, get their lunch, come back, um, and as soon as you can, um, we'll start to compile things. Kathy? What? So yeah, anybody who's working on uh, or has recommendations on the, um, dis uh, what is it, the census data products, go to Kathy. Um, and then Krishna, um, who must be taking a phone call, I'm sure he'll be back shortly. He's doing the disclosure avoidance. Anything else for Andrew? Um, you can certainly also, if you've already been writing it, you could email it to each of them. And we'll try to compile that quite quickly so that then um, we can start reviewing. I've already emailed out to everybody, so maybe you can view on your phones. Um, you know, once you've gotten your input to those three people, you can view on your phones what we compiled yesterday so we can start thinking about edits. And what we want to edit for is content, not style. So uh, hopefully the style's pretty good, um, but it'll slow us down dramatically. And by the way, the consequences of not finishing by 2 o'clock are that we will have to um, wait six weeks and have a virtual public meeting um, and then that slows down our getting the answers. Um, so we want to be, you know, pretty speedy. You know, um, this is uh, not a document that has to go through all kinds of legal review. It's just our recommendations and the experts have already put a lot of good thought into them. So um, please keep that in mind. Okay, uh, grab your lunch.
You all are so good. So now um, you should go to, I think Kathy's got input from everybody on the data products. Is that right? Um, so if not, please scoot over here and talk with her. Um, if you have anything for Krishna on um, disclosure avoidance, um, I know uh, Deborah emailed something, and you, hopefully you got that. I think I forwarded it to you. And then Kunal had something. Oh, you didn't get Deborah's? So let me see. And if anybody else, yep. Or you can go talk with him or send it to him. Um, and then uh, Andrew, obviously, he's got the economic census. So let's just try to finish those up in like 15 minutes.
So Andrew so and uh, Krishna, as soon as you're done, if no. you can email it to what do you need? Something for CSAC the chair at yeah. gmail.com. Did you get the stuff that John Okay, so we're just. There's 10 pages, so in an yeah. hour, we have half an hour, it's fine. Yeah, so we got 10 pages to cover. Uh, I know. We're waiting for you.
Um, so while Krishna's finishing that up, I'm going to explain um, something to um, <laughs> the new folks, and also um, I think Andrew and Kathy may have been the only ones who didn't realize. Um, this is an unusual meeting where um, we didn't have discussions for a lot of topics, and so um, what I did was actually um, go ahead and ask some of the current members to sort of serve as discussants, right, to review the materials that were provided in advance and prepare some thoughts, and then, as you saw, actually compile the um, information. Um, but in most meetings, we usually have a discussion, uh, a discussant, and um, what uh, I certainly heard from several folks was that, you know, the amount of time uh, was very brief. Obviously, we had a lot to cover, but we wanted to make, you know, in future, we want to kind of make sure we go back to how we usually do it, where we have a discussant, ideally we have more detail, um, that we get the materials in advance. Um, so we want to, you know, not set a new precedent based on this meeting that's not productive, or as productive as we would like. So, um, or as useful. Or as useful as we would like. Um, and, you know, the idea, of course, is that, you, you know, we come here to have a good discussion, and it should have um, some good information behind it, and we should have time for the discussion. Um, and that, you know, if the, if the Census Bureau has something that they would like to inform us about and don't need as much time for discussion, there's, there's other options, which are these one-way briefings. So move items like that to um, one-way briefings. So, so first, we started with some language just about reaffirming that uh, we would We're not sure if it's the decennial area, which is one piece of the, of the Census Bureau, or the Census Bureau. Oh. So sometimes people say, right, say everyone. if you mean the organization, say Census Bureau. It's just a comment. No, it, it, it removes the, 
it removes the ambiguity. Yeah. Okay. Wow, it's weird that there's a delay. That's not helpful. We don't know why there's a delay in our, like she just scrolled, but for some reason it's not. Okay, now we need some help. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Technical gurus, we love you. Anyway, you have this on your iPhone, so please do continue reviewing. Round number, uh, question number four under the, uh, is, although there's a couple numbers, thanks. Wow. Why did I, was it this, maybe? Mine is not. It has to be updated. Can you tell about? He's coming. He's turning off. The questions, um, there they are. There they are. It just came back, whatever magical thing <coughs> you did. Can I ask you just a couple clarifying questions on process? Yes. Um, for us, process is really important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. This is Rochelle Winkler. I'm uh, just asking some clarifying questions on process since I'm new. Um, it sounds like, yes, we use our microphones. Um, the second question is um, the way we present these recommendations, um, like thinking about these, uh, the drafted ones for the update on 2020 census, are these, um, it says CSEC has questions related to address canvassing and cost savings, right? Do we expect them to respond to each of these questions the way it's written like this? Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. And they will, which is awesome. No. If you think it's not phrased correctly, you should speak up. Or if we're not going to get the answer we want from the question no. based on how it's phrased. So not like it's no. stylistic, but if there's a meaning question. Yeah. Yep. John, yes? Kathy, why don't you take a separate mic and sit oh. more yeah. down here. Good point. Um, so s the highlighted number, somebody highlighted because they probably weren't sure what that percent was supposed to be. Does anybody that, know what that it was? That was me. This is Jeff Lauer. That was, I, I believe that's what Al said was the estimated uh, yeah. number for the uh, self response. All uh. right. Yes. Okay, so we can take off the highlight. Okay. And scroll down. There's a bit of a delay from. It's not a question. Okay. So it's not helpful. No. Uh, I don't um, know what to do about it. Yeah. Anyone?
all the bandwidth. So I think this piece is about the, fed, the research centers that uh, we had a few questions about. Ken Simonson, the third line of the paragraph, the citizenship question, making a reconstruction a tax. Is a tax supposed to be some other word? I think it's Kunal's, uh, sorry, it's Christian Rao. Oh, it's, uh, Kunal's paragraph, my guess is that it's not supposed to be plural, it's just a reconstruction attack. Oh, okay. Or making a reconstruction attack. Yeah, perfect. We will ask Enid to spell check. Mm -hmm. All right, on this one, let me push the sentence. The citizenship question one. Oh, and it should be the, the citizenship data. It's not even a question. What does it say? At the top. Data. Yeah. Okay, people, we have 10 minutes left. Let me... Um, And we, that's recommending the Federal Register and a public plan. Uh, this is Juan Pablo's piece about computer science and health data privacy. Maybe recommends engaging with.
go. There we go. Anyways, uh, is summarizing some of the things I said in the presentation, but I welcome comments. Sounds good. And I got to read the rest, so I'm good with that. Anybody need to read anything else? We have six minutes. Yeah, we have six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's important, obviously, because we're about to vote. So uh, you need to feel like you've read it enough to be able to vote for it. Yep. I can't hear what you're saying. I still can't. Deborah's on the phone. Oh, Deborah's on the phone? Oh, yeah, she might have emailed something. Oh. <laughs> Deborah, my dear. We're looking forward to your being at the next meeting, Deborah. <laughs> I am glad to come. I don't need to be. I didn't get anything. Oh, no, no, she did email something that I gave to Krishna, and he included it. Uh, De Deborah, can you hear me? This is Christian Rodgers. If you can hear, I, I took your notes and just kind of wove them into the rest of the narrative, so they didn't show. They don't show up as like a bullet format, but I think all the content was captured. Right. Yeah. And we discussed it a little bit, so there were a few edits um, here, Deborah. So uh, if there's something that's slightly changed, it's because of a discussion we had. So, um, all right. Are we ready? Has so everybody read enough so they can vote? Feel free to say if you need to review something on here. We're good? Okay. Okay. Well, then, all in favor of these recommendations, approving the recommendations? Okay. Very good. Well done. All right. That's unanimous. We will send them to you to fix the format, I mean, the fonts <laughs> I need, and uh, you'll catch our typos, light typos, yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you all very much. That was a ton, <laughs> it was really an amazing. We usually don't have that much in one agenda, and we won't in future, and you know, a lot of really important stuff before the decennial census, obviously, to cover today. Um, did you have something to say, Krishna? No, no, okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you to the census okay. officials and staff. Uh, this is Tommy Wright, I, I think someone's waiting on me to say, a royal thank you to everyone on the committee and thanks to everyone from the Census Bureau and uh, to the technology staff, audio and visual, and a special applause for Enid, the director yeah. and producer. <laughs> I have a safe trip back. I should say that the next meeting is March 18th and 19th. March 18th and 19th. And anyone who wants to ride to National Airport or uh, the Urban Institute, I am driving past those places and would be glad to give four people a ride. <laughs>